Okay, we're back in session, and we have a real treat. We have the first ever student representative to the Board of Curators Report by uh, Mr. Avery Walker. Uh, Dr. Choi would like to say something first. So, Mr. Avery Walker from Missouri S&T will receive his degree in petroleum engineering, master's degree on December 15th, and then he'll be continuing on for his PhD for petroleum engineering. And here is the pride of Perryville, Missouri, <laughs> Mr. Avery Walker. Well, thanks for the lovely introduction. Proud of Perryville, I like that. I'm gonna bring that home just in case they didn't know. Uh, so, you know, this is only three full pages single space, so uh, <laughs> bear with me. So, what I did was I went through and I asked each organization, the Intercampus Student Council, to go ahead and give me things that they wanted me to report. So, I asked them to talk about respective struggles and successes and to share them with me so I could share them with you guys. So I'll start with the Intercampus Student Council and what we're doing. So we had our first meeting of the year in the end of September. We took some time, get acquainted with each other, shared some different campus updates, and we discussed ideas to determine what we would like to focus on in the coming year. So on Friday, when we have our next meeting, we'll be finalizing those ideas. Let's see. Next, I've got ASUM. Uh, they've been working very hard on their intern selection process, and they're very happy to announce that they have eight qualified interns for this position, or for their positions up in Jeff City. So additionally, for the first time, each university will be equally represented in the team, two interns per university. Those interns went to training last weekend so they could be prepared for the spring semester job. And also over October 15th through the 20th, ASUM worked with local student governments to promote the system's efforts to transition to affordable and open educational resources. Students wrote thank you notes to faculty members who transitioned to those materials. And they are also working on raising awareness of the total cost savings from those classes that transitioned over to those affordable resources. All right, so next I'll move on to Columbia and talk about MSA. So MSA's auxiliary, Tiger Pantry, received a $2,500 donation from Kroger to buy food from their pantry. And they're also running a canned food drive for Tiger Pantry before the Thanksgiving holiday. They also partnered with Mizzou Athletics and IFC to bring former Mizzou basketball alumnus and former NBA player Kean Dooling to campus. They filled Jesse Auditorium with almost 600 students as he shared his story about mental health and his passion to end the stigma surrounding it. The partnership involved two free tickets to the Mizzou-Kentucky game where IFC held a benefit concert before the game for the Boys and Girls Club of Columbia and raised $70,000. The Engineering Student Council hosted the National Association of Engineering Student Councils and they hosted 50 members, which was the highest attendance for that conference. And over Mizzou's 107th homecoming, the student blood drive collected a staggering 3,906 units of blood carrying with it the potential to save 11,718 lives in only four days. Additionally, the students gathered to give back to the community 2,136 hours of service, raising $5,030 for Rainbow House, and donating 26,764 pounds of canned food. So they had a pretty productive week. Now I'll move on to the Graduate Professional Council for Mizzou. So they say, first, GPC is happy to announce the establishment of a financial assistance fund. This fund will help graduate and professional students in financial crisis while working and studying for the university. Funds will be raised entirely from donations to and fundraiser opportunities from GPC. The Financial Assistance Fund is also going live on giving.missouri.edu. We are located under university-wide funds under graduate studies listed as GPC Financial Assistance <coughs> Fund. They ask that you guys keep them in mind during any of your end of the year giving. Second, GPC is thrilled to host the National Association of Graduate and Professional Students, their South Central Regional Meeting in the upcoming April. MUGPC is a legacy member of this National Graduate Professional Student Advocacy Association. Hosting a regional meeting will draw graduate and professional students from across the region to Mizzou, putting us front and center regarding student advocacy and leadership. Official dates and schedules are forthcoming. So next we've got our report from UMKC Student Government. They've been working on several different things recently, including they've established their executive cabinet of their Student Government Association. They're working on reinstating their recycling program on campus, and they're looking at gathering information on the current model 
the Johnson County Community College, and they're looking at rolling that program out very slowly to be able to measure the metrics and the successes of that program. They're also currently working with students on campus to improve the reporting process for Title IX issues to make that process more straightforward. And lastly, they are going through all the student fees and assessing their necessity, and they're going to pass this information on to the next executive board so they may make more informed decisions about fees as that window is closed for the current year. All right, next for S&T, from Stuco. S&T students have been concerned this semester with the faculty's look into a plus minus grading system. Students have largely voiced that they are against any such grading system for a number of reasons, particularly they feel it would make an already difficult school more difficult, and it would make their GPAs less attractive to their prospective employers and their competition in other schools. Our students have also worked to raise money for our student emergency fund, which aids students who are in crisis. Our fundraising campaign from the beginning of the year to homecoming raised around $2,000, and recently another fundraiser was held at the Price Chopper and Rala, and they would like to thank Curator Steelman for participating in that fundraiser. Additionally, our tool for students to view their professor's evaluation data has been live for a few months, and it is finally being put to good use as students sign up for the Spring 19 classes. And this tool so far has been met with lots of positive feedback. They are also looking into implementing a new transportation system that's modeled after one of our very own senior design projects. And we're looking forward to April 19th because that's the date of the opening of the fitness center. And uh, we hope to, or they hope to invite everyone to the grand opening. Now for CGS at Missouri s and the Council of Graduate Students at s and is pursuing ways to strengthen its relationship with the campus administration, UM system, and board of curators in order to enhance the graduate student experience at Missouri s and we are currently addressing and discussing possible solutions to the instability our graduate students experience. One perception our graduate students have is that their graduate student experience would be improved with better communication and additional transparency from the Missouri s and administration and the UM system. Secondly, our current and future graduate students are looking for better financial stability and career opportunities from the university. In response to these concerns raised by their constituents and the Council of Graduate Students, they are initiating the following actions. They're going to develop a student-run career fair focused on our graduate students and develop an alumni outreach program geared towards establishing alumni endowments for graduate students. All right, next up we've got UMSL. So UMSL is excited that their Triton Food Pantry has opened up again yesterday on the 14th. It's a pop-up pantry that helps supply perishable and non-perishable foods to food insecure students. One in five UMSL students is facing hunger or low food security, and many students at UMSL are also parents, so the pantry is a huge help to those students, especially ahead of Thanksgiving. The pantry is served between 75 and 100 students every time it has opened up, and it provides students with an average of 10 items. Now, while the pantry has been focused mainly on students, it's also given to staff that are in need. Additionally, the Alumni Association funds a snack pack program to give students a no questions asked way of getting snacks throughout the week so they can focus more on class. The Campus Safe Walk had another successful year put on by UMSL's SGA with participation from campus police, residential life and housing, faculty and staff. They were able to bring an engineer from MoDOT to walk one of the paths and she will be receiving information on the area that she walked which is in MoDOT's domain. And now personally for what I'm doing as the student rep, I have just started working with President Choi and Steve Graham's office to better utilize student evaluations to improve the quality of instruction throughout the whole system. And I'm looking forward to diving into that now that I've finished my thesis. And that's what I got. Any questions? Any questions? Hey, Avery, when you, when you tell students that you are the student rep to the curators, what, what is their thoughts or feelings or what do they say to you about that? Most people don't really understand what that is. They haven't really heard of that. So I try to give a little insight as to what I do. And whenever I tell them, they think, well, yeah, that seems very important. You know, very Good. valuable position. Good. Thank any, you. any other questions? Avery, thank you very much. You survived. Thank you. <laughs> thank Good you. report. I'm hoping everyone has had an opportunity to review the consent agenda and that I could hear a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. second. Uh, having had a motion and second to approve the consent agenda, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? Uh, the motion carries and the, and the consent agenda is approved. Now, Curator Snowden. Where is he? Right here. There you are. 
Uh, your committee is up. We are? I thought we were at 345. <laughs> We, we, may, we may need to adjust, but we will do so on the fly. Uh, uh, Curator Snowden, I see that Steve Graham is here uh, to present the online strategy discussion, and when he's done, we're going to ask you to regale us with tales of your intercampus faculty council uh, interaction. Oh. It, Cindy, did we, did we cross the curator up with our revised agenda? Is that what we've done? I will say, uh, Phil, we did revise the agenda to make some more time for closed session. Are you ready? Yep. Okay. No go. Mr. Chairman, I think uh, we have uh, one, one uh, informational item and one action item, as I recall. And uh, <clears throat> the first uh, informational item will be uh, talking about the interfaculty council and the meetings that we've had o over this past year. As you'll recall, the board implemented this program about three years ago, and since then we've had uh, two meetings every year plus roundtable discussions on several occasions. Uh, I think it's been very beneficial. I think the uh, interfaculty council has enjoyed the interaction with curators. I think because of that, they get the feeling that they know us better and that we know them better, and I think it's been a healthy uh, dialogue. Uh, I'd point out that we've had two meetings this year. The first one was in Columbia, and Curator Sunvold and Curator Steelman attended that meeting along with myself, and the uh, first thing we did was the IFC kind of outlined their achievements for the year and highlighted uh, the issues of teacher evaluation. Uh, second point I would make is that we talked about the administrative review and the potential consolidation with the goal of bridging the gap between stagnant revenue and increasing expenses at the university and throughout. Uh, we discussed the university task force and the, unique, and the uniqueness of each campus. And I think each of the schools with their particular representatives expressed to us and shared their views of how each university was unique and different. Uh, moving to the fall retreat, that was in Boonville, and unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, I guess, maybe for the students, I was the only curator there. But uh, it was a healthy discussion. We again discussed the university task force and what w that was completed in the summer and talked about their uh, goals and what had been accomplished. Uh, I think all of the curators, I pointed out to them that all of the curators agreed that we are one university system, but we are four separate, unique university campuses. And uh, I think they're, we're starting to get a real buy-in to that concept, and I think that's good all the way around. Uh, I expressed, and I think the Interfaculty Council expressed at that meeting, actually Dr. Choi came in right after I was there with the group, and we all expressed our support and confidence in President Choi and his leadership and uh, what he brings to the university. So uh, all in all, I thought it was a, a very good session on both of them, and I would uh, recommend that we continue to do this on an annual basis. If there's any questions on that, I'd be happy to answer them. I would point out that Curator Snowden has been the chair of this committee ever since we started this procedure and that you have diligently met with the faculty and, and talked to them and got their views every year. That's extra effort uh, by, by Curator Snowden, but I believe it has been uh, a very good opportunity. And I, and I do feel that we as curators have a better relationship with the faculty now, in large part due to your efforts, Phil. Well, and, and because of that, I think I'm the favorite curator of all the uh, professors on the various campuses. So I want you all to know that, <laughs> whether you believe it or not. <laughs> uh, so, Mr. Chairman, I don't think we need a motion or anything on that particular report. We do have an action item uh, dealing with a Bachelor of Arts degree at UMSL, dealing with uh, uh, 
computer science. And that Steve Graham is here to introduce uh, the faculty member that's going to present this program. And uh, uh, it's something I think is needed. And the thing I caught from that particular <clears throat> outline of what that degree is, is that out of 10 possible jobs out in the marketplace right now, about six out of 10 of them are really related to computer science in some way, which I think is very, very important. So, Dr. Graham. Would you like to do Let's uh, do the action item first. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just talk briefly for a second. I'm gonna invite Dr. Teresa Teal, who's the Associate Dean of Arts and Science up. If you recall, we have a new process now where we're asking the, the deans or department chairs to come up. Um, as Curator Snowden mentioned, it's a Bachelor of Science degree in Computing Technology. Um, I think it's a really good degree for the marketplace here in St. Louis, and I'll ask Dr. Teal to step forward and talk about it briefly. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today about an innovative and um, important program for our campus. So the Bachelor of Science in Computing Technology at UMSL will educate and prepare current and future students for careers in the technology sector. And as the curator said, these graduates will help us to meet the growing technology workforce needs, both of the St. Louis region and the state of Missouri. In Missouri, six of 10 jobs with the best outlook for employment are in the computer science and technology area. This new degree program that we're proposing today will grow with the increasing demand for jobs in this field. And this will stimulate further student interest in the computing technology degree. The Bachelor of Science in Computing Technology differs from the BS in Computer Science. It requires less in the way of upper level math and computer science courses, replacing them with courses that are more technology based. This removes some of the barriers to graduation for many students, leading to an increase in student retention and graduation rates. The program will serve both current and future students who want to learn more about the applied and technological aspects of computer science and are not so interested in graduate school. It will allow us to better retain current students who want this practical emphasis focusing on the business needs of the technology sector. Students who now attend local private universities that offer similar pro degree programs. The new computing technology degree will not require any new courses. It simply makes better use of existing courses and our existing faculty resources. However, as the enrollment in the program grows, we anticipate needing new courses in computer science in the future, so that probably by year five, we will require two new faculty positions, probably one in the second year and one in the fourth year of the program. The computing technology degree is different from, but complementary to, the information technology degree offered by MU. Computing technology focuses more heavily on teaching programming skills to build computer technology versus skills for using technology. Computing technology requires more math and computer science courses than does information technology. However, as both MU and UMSL develop online courses that can serve both the computing technology <coughs> and the information technology programs, we anticipate increased opportunities for cross-campus collaboration in these two complementary programs. The computing technology degree is designed to attract and serve the place-bound <coughs> UMSL student population, many of whom currently now go to local private institutions for these degrees. So in summary, the computing technology degree will offer our students the training they need to meet the growing technology workforce demands of the St. Louis region and the state of Missouri. The computing technology degree aligns well with the strategic plan, which states that UMSL is committed to providing innovative programs that lead to successful graduates who support the growth of businesses and organizations in the greater St. Louis community. Thank you. Any questions? <clears throat> I have a couple. 
I, I'm sort of intrigued about <clears throat> where this kind of course has fallen on different campuses. <clears throat> and I look at it from the perspective of health uh, data analytics. So the uh, UMKC has a, a college of um, Biological. Com computer sciences and engineering is the name of the school. And so you get your most computer sciences in the engineering school. <clears throat> I believe Dean Laboa was, uh, is, is she here? She's here. She yes. may not be in the room. She is. <clears throat> no, she's all the way in the back, John. <clears throat> she, she is heavy and, and, <clears throat> and I know has substantial courses in uh, computer science in the engineering school. And I think herself is heavy into bio uh, data analytics. Um, and as I understand it, this program, which I'm in favor of, uh, is going to be in arts and science. Is that right? It is. So, and, and I mentioned all of those in, in those particular schools because 20% uh, of our uh, GNP is in healthcare, and it's increasingly digital driven and requires computer, really good computers. In fact, most good medical researchers now uh, are teamed up with PhD technical computer sciences. Uh, so how does this fit into that whole stratagem? And I'm gonna take it back to the translational precision uh, medicine complex or whatever we end up calling it, we may change the name. Um, this obviously can be a feeder into that kind of a program do you see cross-campus collaboration uh, beyond Columbia? Do you think that what you're doing might fit uh, across all campuses and, and would it be possible in the future for you to have this course or this degree have courses that are online, maybe, uh, uh, maybe uh, actually not, uh, well, just, just all, online or, or e-learning so that uh, people that are getting into it from different schools uh, might benefit from some of the courses that you're having. I do, and I think that having different campuses with different focuses is really helpful to our students. So, you know, fundamentally, computer science, information science, information technology, computing technology, they all share a sort of fundamental core and what changes, I think, especially for the uh, more sort of emphasis areas is how the students will be trained in particular kinds of courses that would lead them into different jobs. And so, for example, if there were health related, uh, if there were a computing course at Kansas City that was more focused on analysis of large data sets, that could be very useful in terms of health. Similarly, on the, on the um, Columbia campus, although it's in engineering, they're very, I think, focused also on some of the biological things and bioinformatics. So it makes, doesn't make a lot of sense for every campus to try to replicate a computer science track that, that specifically goes to particular emphasis areas by sharing, especially upper division and technology-based courses, I think what we can do is provide foundational courses through computer science, information science, information technology, but especially through online courses, allow students then to specialize, which might make them more marketable and also would serve the needs of the businesses. That was, that was uh, a friendly question and I'm, uh, the answer I hoped I'd get. Let me ask you one follow-up question. Are there currently any uh, e-learning courses uh, that would be in this program as we speak here today? And if so, are they uh, synchronistic or asynchronistic? I believe, and I'll look to Cesare, that we have two online courses. Is that correct? One, okay. One, and, and is it uh, asynchronistic? Uh, it's online. Asynchronous. Asynchronous. Fully online. Thank yeah. you. Great. So I, I have a question. You mentioned that this will be a partnership with the information technology program that's offered at Mizzou. 
And so will you be sharing courses as well as part of this uh, computing technology program? I've had conversations with colleagues in that department and our understanding is that both campuses are working to develop more online courses and that by sharing those courses, we can avoid duplication That's and great. serve the students on both campuses. That is so, great. Yes. And so with that capacity and also if we can get UMKC and SNT to participate, we would love to see a program like this be elevated and scaled up to meet the workforce needs in the state, especially in IT, computing technology, as well as data sciences. So I wanna thank you for your efforts and also the collaborative approach in which you've designed the program. Thank you. Thank you, great job. Any more questions? Just a comment that I'm really excited to see uh, something coming out of the Bachelor of Arts that uh, get students into jobs that pay $60,000 plus a year. Mm -hmm. At least. Mm -hmm. At least. That is great. Thank uh, you. If there are no more questions, could I have a motion and a second to approve uh, as a new degree program the Bachelor's of Science in Computing Technology at the <coughs> University of Missouri St. St. Louis. Oh, that's in the committee? Have I, have I, have let I, the, let the committee have I sat on you a little bit? <laughs> All right, sorry, job. sorry. Move approval. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I are, stand, there any other, I stand are there any other questions stand. about this particular degree by anyone? <laughs> if not, I'm looking for a motion and a second to adopt approval. this Bachelor of Computing Technology, Computing Technology for UMSL. Is there a motion and a second? So moved. Second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstain. Motion carried. Now, Mr. Chairman, I move the adoption <laughs> of recommending that the bachelor's degree in computing technology for UMSL be adopted by the full board. Before I ask for a second, I would remind the curator that I was the curator who bragged on him just a few minutes ago. <laughs> uh, any seconds? Second. All in favor? Uh -huh. Aye. Opposed? <clears throat> any abstentions? Uh, motions carried, and congratulations to University of Missouri-St. Louis on this new program, and best of luck. We have a second item, apparently, on our uh, information, Mr. Chairman, and Stephen Graham is at the podium, so I'll let him take over from here. Okay, um, I have a very easy job today, just introductions, and so um, I just give a couple brief uh, comments to set the tone. Um, as you know, we've talked about before, you hear conversations even now uh, in the recent uh, discussion about the computing technology degree, about online and e-learning courses. Um, we've done a nice job, I think, in the past. Our faculty are engaged. We've offered a number of courses that our students take. Um, but I think that there's a real desire, and particularly now is sort of the time to move and be very bold in the online space. And so we are making very bold plans. We put in a proposal to the MDHE as part of this to develop a completely uh, online strategy and program that will serve adult learners across the state. Um, to do this, we're t undertaking a significant effort and we've engaged a system-wide task force made up of uh, members from all four campuses and we also have engaged EY Parthenon uh, as a strategic partner, one of the well-known firms in this area. And so I would like to introduce their, one of their managing partners, Haven Ladd, who will come forward and talk about uh, some of the concepts that they're going to be working with us on. And then he'll leave quite a bit of time for questions too. So with that. Great. Uh, thank you all for the opportunity to be in front of you this afternoon. Uh, I'll try and keep my remarks fairly brief as we are kicking off this project uh, officially now, and I, I do, as Steve said, want to keep a, a fair bit of time open for questions. So there's a few slides, um, uh, both in the presentation format and in printed packets that I will go through quickly. They're intended to do three things. Um, one, to give you as curators an outline of this project um, that Steve referenced mm -hmm. and, and sort of the scope and pacing of it, as well as some of the key milestones. The second objective, objective is to share with you some initial data, both on the market as well as some internal facts and figures as it relates to e-learning across the system. And the third is to share with you sort of initial thinking on 
structure and vision of where this could go. Um, so I'll try and do all of that. I'll try and do all of that in, in 12 minutes or so and save time for questions if we can. So going on to the, the next slide is just a quick outline of the project overall. We at uh, Parthenon EY, where I'm one of the, the partners who leads a lot of our education work with a wide range of higher education institutions, were engaged by the system about a week ago, um, maybe nine days ago, something like that. And yesterday had our first kickoff meeting with the task force that has been assembled to address this question from a strategic standpoint. Uh, the project overall will go for, you know, until the middle of March or so. The idea during that time period is to really do two things, gather a lot of market facts that address where the opportunity is for the system to go forward and develop what could be a, a more transformational opportunity in the <coughs> e-learning space, and two, to assess and understand what are the many capabilities that already exist across the system, across all the, the four universities within the system, because whatever happens in the future our argument is should be building off of some of the great successes that have happened so far. Uh, the task force, just so everyone, at least all the curators know, is um, comprised of about 16 members across the system. It includes the president uh, and two of you as curators, so thank you for your time already in this, as well as the four provosts of each of the campus, a number of faculty representatives, the CFO, and a few others. So it is a um, very robust task force of a broad range of decision makers. So the hope with that task force and the structure that's been outlined is that over the course of the next 20 or so weeks where <coughs> we as consultants are involved, it is not a period of consultants doing work in the background, delivering some report, which will then be processed, thought about, and digested over years and may or may not lead to action, but rather it can be a much more dynamic working process where decisions can be made to help the university go down this path very quickly, um, as quickly as sort of prudence will allow. Um, going on to the next page very quickly, uh, just to outline some of the key activities that we uh, are addressing. Uh, you have these so you can look back at them. There's a lot more detail around the project plan, but I just want to give everyone a sense of what are the sort of key topic er areas that we have been tasked with and how we'll think about looking at these. Uh, there's really four that we're addressing in the early parts of this work. Current state assessment internally across the four universities, market analysis and identification of potential op options and opportunities for the system, evaluation of what technology or technologies is at play today across the four campuses. That's a complex one. We'll talk more about it uh, later. And then Ultimately, what comes out of this is what we think of as a very clear operational plan. That is different from a vision. You should not come out of this with a vision of where you want to go, but rather the hope of these next 20 weeks is that the system comes out with a very clear plan of how we move forward, what needs to change, why we are doing it in a way that can be articulated to a wide range of stakeholders. So that's sort of the objective that we've been given. That's how we've outlined it um, for all of you. The next page hits on uh, just a quick overview of some of the market trends. I'll pause briefly on this page and then go into some facts and figures, which might be harder to see on the, on the screen. But I want to hit on you know, two big themes. First of all, on the, on the left of this, when you think about the core macro trend that's facing higher education today, it is that overall post-secondary enrollment rates are flat. They will remain flat for a long time to come. So we are not at the end of this recessionary period in demand for post-secondary enrollments, but rather we believe roughly in the middle of it. Um, and during that period of overall flatness for enrollments, there has been growth over the last 15 years quite substantially of online or hybrid or e-learning enrollments. Won't get into the detailed definitions right now, I don't think we need to, but we believe um, as outsiders that that growth or that dynamic of flat or declining on-ground enrollment, a lot of growth in e-learning, will continue for the foreseeable future. Um, in addition, there is a substantial underserved population 
in this state today, and it gets bigger if you begin to sort of expand the catchment radius to some surrounding states, um, that potentially could be served within the mission of the University of Missouri system today. Um, there's roughly 450,000 adult learners today who don't have a bachelor's uh, degree, or some have a, a few of a bachelor's degree, we'll talk about in specific numbers later, but who could use further education of the type that could be delivered by the system to fulfill their role in the workforce, their role in economic development, their role as citizens. That is an opportunity that is sort of there for the taking and within the mission and, organ and, and vision and historic competencies of the University of Missouri system. When we look over to the right side of this, uh, you have, as a system, done some really good things. You've been growing online and hybrid enrollments faster than the national average. That's great. You have grown those faster than your on-ground enrollments. Um, however, on a national basis, you are still not particularly well known and nor are you perceived as yet having a leadership position in this whole world of e-learning. Um, and finally, the third point I want to make is that, you know, there's only about 5%. We only serve about 5% of our population in a fully online or virtual way. Um, many students, and I'll show you the numbers on the next page, or two pages from now, within the state of Missouri, choose to enroll in an online program provided by an institution outside of the state. And most times when they do that, they end up paying more. I would argue that's not good for anyone except for those providers of online learning. It's not good for the students. So a couple uh, facts to share with you on page five, if we can turn the slides. This is a quick picture, similar structure of the picture on the left and the right. On the left, this is enrollment totals for all institutions within the state of Missouri. The gray bars on the bottom are on-ground enrollments. The very bright on the screen green bars are the hybrid enrollments, and the blue bars at the top represent online enrollment. Um, That's online only. And this is online only. It's a great question. Um, and what you can see statewide is also a pattern that has revealed itself nationwide. I'm just not going to show it to you here, which is that on ground is declining at about 4% a year. So the, the growth rate numbers are compound annual growth rates on the right of that chart. Online and hybrid are growing at 6% and 2% respectively, and the overall top line number is down about 2% statewide. <coughs> so no growth, in fact, declines on site and, and it's barely being held up by online. On the right is the same cut of data, but just looking at you as a system overall in aggregate or in combination. You serve about 75,000 students over this time, 76,000 in FY18. You have been doing a little bit better than the state overall. Top line growth of about 1% per year. But the same pattern underneath that belies the shift in mix where you are losing about 2% a year in fully on ground students, picking up 16% in hybrid and 7% in fully online. Um, this is the reality today. So, so in many ways, this is good. You have made great steps forward we have been given a mandate as outsiders to help you make much bigger leaps going forward beyond this. In terms of where those leaps could go, it's worth looking at the next page briefly. Um, this is a, Just so I can yes, make sure I absolutely. Understand. So what you're saying is bricks and mortar, whether we're talking about University of Missouri or all the institutions in Missouri, uh, you know, the on ground, I think you called it declining in each of those five year periods. Of course, online and hybrid are, okay, thank you. What we see nationwide is the vast majority of higher education institutions are developing online options, online learning options or e-learning options which are made available to their historically on-ground students. We would expect in the near term, three to five to eight years, that there will be essentially no one who is studying 100% on-ground who doesn't take any of their coursework in an online format. It doesn't mean that there's, there'll be no on-ground courses. I want to say something quite different from that. But the way students interact these days is increasingly online, and every institution is reacting in, in that same way. So when we think about some of the opportunity out there, 
there's lots of ways of framing it, and this is the very beginning. We, we, see, we presented this slide to the task force yesterday to get some reactions, and I think in general I would take the reactions as, yep, there's an opportunity out there. So one way to think about the opportunity is to look at the population of Missouri that's over 25. The reason for picking that is that's the population age group that's a little bit beyond what we've historically served as, as the system between undergraduate and graduate programs. And then we can sort of winnow down that population and say, where are there demographic pockets within that that might have a need for higher education? Well, there's 400,000 already have master's or professional or doctoral degrees. So let's put them aside and say, well-educated. Good job. There's 700,000 that have a bachelor's degree only today. There's about 800,000 that um, have some college, you know, two years plus of college or an associate degree and another roughly 400,000 that have less than two years of college, but again, some college overall. We have done in other work that I've been involved in surveys of these similar populations to assess their appetite, their willingness to go to higher ed, go get more education if the education is made available to them, and elsewhere that number of about 30% interest has come up. Again, we're, we're going to resurvey here to figure out how that looks across the state. But if you apply that 30% of this population that says maybe these people need more education in order to fulfill their careers and drive economic impact for the state, you'd say there's something on the order of 575,000 additional people in this state that could be served. I'd be willing very easily in this room to say, well, let's not focus on those that might need an associate degree because the community college system across the state does that you're still left with 450,000 or so students who potentially could be served in some way, shape, or form by the, the, uni the University of Missouri system. And I'm not saying that you can get 450,000 incremental students. It's sort of a market demand potentially out there. Um, so another way of looking at that, so that's one, that's sort of the hypothetical, a lot of bodies out there. A second way of looking at, and this is probably the last slide of numbers I'll share with you, is on the next page, which looks at who is enrolling in online learning or e-learning today. And there are three different ways of cutting this number that I want to share with you. The first on the left is roughly 32,000 Missouri residents who are enrolled in online programs today at in-state institutions, institutions with, here within Missouri. There's an additional 21,000 students um, who are Missouri residents who are attending online programs out of state at places like Western Governors University, University of Phoenix, Ashworth College, American Public Education, Southern New Hampshire University, just to name a few. And finally, there's about 25,000 out of state students who are enrolled in online programs here within state. And uh, I've highlighted the University of Missouri system universities on this bar and your share of that is relatively small given your size and scale and reputation. So I would make the case to all of you as we kick off this project that there's a big market opportunity out there. I will not make the case that it's easy to get. It's a crowded landscape. You have to think incrementally, transformatively, and differently to achieve that market opportunity. But there is a need to serve students, there's a need that would drive the economy, and there's a need that, if done well, would generate excess surpluses that could be reinvested in research and fulfilling the mission of the system. Um, so I'll skip over, and I'll leave one slide up there in the end. If I can skip to uh, three slides to that slide, thank you very much, and I'll leave it there. Um, the task force debated yesterday uh, in our session, how to think about aspirationally where this might go. And this is just the beginnings of the thinking, the guideposts, if you are, for, for, our, for our work as sort of consultants helping the task force. And there's four big sort of guideposts that were offered. One is that this will be big and bold. And by that, the number that was thrown out was about 25,000 incremental enrollments. So if we think about serving 75,000 students today, we're talking about the system serving 100,000 students in the future, and that future defined as near term, so five years out. 
that's a, a rate of growth that is obviously incredibly fast. You can debate that on your own. Second of all, that this would initially focus on the demand in and immediately surrounding Missouri. This is not an effort to say immediately you will be um, an online platform that serves students from Massachusetts to Hawaii. You might eventually get there, that's great, but focus on the market demand around you. The third, that this is predominantly focused at adult learners, so that it is not directly competing with what you already do today. Cannibalizing your 75,000 students and then calling them online students doesn't get you incremental growth. And the goal here is incremental growth. And finally, that this should be pointed largely at incremental bachelor degrees for those that don't have them, as well as perhaps a substantial number of graduate level certificates. Um, there could be some master's degrees uh, in there as well at a slightly smaller scale, but really not at the associate level to avoid any conflict or competition with your friends and allies in the community college space. So I'll pause there. Um, that's all I have to say for today. I'm happy to take any questions, um, and I'll answer what I know from the beginning of the project, uh, or take feedback to guide the rest of the project. Any questions? I, I might start with one. Um, we talk about 20 weeks, and that, that is a very ambitious timetable, particularly in higher education. And can you tell us why or if time is urgent and why, and in a way that we can also share that with the rest of the university community, uh, which might uh, be concerned that we're moving too fast. It always feels like there's a risk to move quickly. <coughs> Higher education is very good at being deliberative and thoughtful with every decision that is made. In the case of online learning, we believe, this is again Sir Parthenon's belief, that the spoils will eventually go to the most successful, to the winners early on. That's different from the way that higher education has been structured for hundreds of years. When you divide it up with land grant institutions in every individual state and every institution on its own had a catchment radius around it of willing and able customers, when we go online, the big and successful, the leading, the bright stars in the online world, we believe, will be able to do what Amazon has done to retail, which is further invest in their processes, their qualities, and by so doing, get better and better relative to everyone else. You still have time to gain market share. We don't know how long you or others have but we do know the time is running out. And we as consultants get RFPs all the time from other institutions, other state systems saying we wanna go fast. Most systems and most universities are held back by their own rate that they can make decisions internally. Um, so it was impressive to see when this project got sort of unofficially kicked off 10 days ago, that nine days later we were able to get a task force of that uh, magnitude together meeting for two hours yesterday. So it sounds like you can move pretty quickly. I have a question, um, and, and only looking for an impression, but on a scale of one to 10, with a one being in the dark ages, and a 10 being at the top uh, among the best in online learning with public universities, on that scale of one to 10, where, where are we? That's such a hard question to ask an outsider I into a nice group of people. Um, I, you have done some really good things and, and moved the needle a long way. I will say you are not known um, outside of this state. I'm not from Missouri. You're not known outside of this state for being an innovator or leader in online. That does not mean there's not pockets of excellence across the system. Um, so it would have to be middle of the pack to answer your question. Five. Five. Okay. I'd like to ask this question. I noticed on the out-of-state uh, students that Webster University, Park University, and Columbia College look to have a large number of those people, right? Correct. Have they been in the game longer than we have and emphasized that a lot more than we have? I take it they have. They have. All of them have, yes. 
So we could probably learn something from those three institutions, could we not? We believe there's a lot to be learned from a variety of institutions and a lot to be learned not necessarily to, to duplicate um, because there are likely things that all three of those do that you wouldn't want to do here. But there are things you can learn from what they're doing well that you absolutely would want to do here. And the nice thing about where you are in this market is there have been a number of large-scale early innovators in the online space. There's a lot to learn from and a lot of mistakes have been made. I would argue if you want to achieve that 25,000 incremental student goal in five years, you can't afford to make many mistakes and nor can you afford to go slowly. So we've got to learn everything you can about what works out there and copy the best and ignore the worst. Is that on the last page? Sorry. Go, you can go ahead. Uh, go ahead. I was just going to say on the last page, are those the, rec the paths forward? Are these the paths forward on the appendix, the last page of the presentation of what's worked? Yeah. And that's in, I shared this in your packet. This is a, um, not a recommendation on paths forward for you. This is what other um, institutions that have grown online have done. It is revealing, if we want to look at it, to look at the time that it has taken for some institutions to get to a level of scale online, or in the ones that have done it very quickly, the paths forward. Um, in the case of UT Arlington, Arizona State, or now Purdue with its acquisition of Kaplan to create a new university in Indiana. Um, but some of the others that we've heard about for years, have, this has not been quick. I apologize that I had to walk out earlier, but as you're thinking about online learning and the system or platform that we would create internally for Missouri students, um, how do you think about providing online education on existing platforms that like Coursera or other kind of uh, online places where we can post our own, our own courses? Yeah, it's, it's important to remember that you're doing a lot today. Um, we have not looked at all the different platforms that you're using. You, I know you use a wide range of technology, and I'm sure some of them are pretty darn good. Um, so on that stuff, there's no necessary reason to always reinvent the wheel. As with technology, you'll always be looking for the next and better platform, et cetera. You'll be migrating and growing. I would, I think right now is my own bias, is that you will likely as a system need to do two things in parallel. You'll need to continue serving your, the online learning needs of your 75,000 students today just, across all four campuses, across all four universities, excuse me, and also do something more transformative to get at a new market opportunity above and beyond that. And they may or may not, they may be on the same platform, different platforms, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Two questions. Uh, first of all, well, I'll, I'll put them together because I think they may go together. Um, you said that uh, at least initially predominantly adult learners, and then we may go to traditional and others. Any problem with, as we're developing courses, having them offered to traditional learners that are on site? Any problem with that? No. Okay. The, with respect to the adult le learners, how are we going to keep them engaged and motivated? Problem, one problem with e-learning is that if you, you don't show up, you don't have to show up in class generally, and people lose interest and, and don't complete their courses unless there is some coaching involved. What do you think of uh, uh, the, the importance of having coaching, not only when we roll out to traditional students, but also adult learners in their homes that aren't going to come to the campus, and maybe the employer isn't paying their way. Maybe they, they've paid, but they, they lose interest. Should we have coaches for everybody? Uh, for everybody or for the adult learners? Sorry. Actually, for everybody. I'm assuming so, <laughs> for traditional students. Theoretically, we have coaches now, but yeah, yeah. Uh, do we need so, special coaches for online and especially for adults? So a, a couple things, a couple of ways of answering that. Um, online versus, online learning versus on ground learning as one distinction. Uh, the online student in general needs a, a different level of support and structure around her than the on-site student does because you don't see them all the time. Um, 
you're already doing a number of those things today. Um, but to keep that student engaged requires a different level of wraparound services, support, et cetera. We talked a fair bit about this yesterday. Adult learners versus traditional age undergraduate or graduate students also need an, a different level of wraparound, coaching, support, mentoring to keep them engaged, help them overcome the challenges of higher education in general. Most of that 450,000 student population or potential student population we looked at is not in higher education for a reason. They may have tried, it's hard, so we, if you're gonna do it well, you need to support those uniquely and, and, and differently. Mm -hmm. um, and that is not to say that your on-ground students don't also need <coughs> coaching and support, but on an order of magnitude, some of these newer populations will need a different approach than we've historically taken on ground. Second question is, how important is quality of what is in e-learning um, or excitement or capturing the attention of the learner? Uh, and I'll just say that years ago I started occasionally getting the great courses, tapes you can get through the New York Times, and, and some of them I binge watch, and some of them after the first two sessions I, I, they're in my closet. So there are people and techniques on how to do it and capture one's attention and others that don't. Um, is that important before we go to market with seeking the next 25,000 that we don't currently have? In a digital world, ultimately the consumer has more power than they used to in a non-digital world. And so by that I mean when you play it out long enough in, in an online or e-learning environment, we will get to the point where consumers, well students, will rate with stars or whatever it is all their individual courses. And of course the barrier to jumping from one program to another gets very, very small. So quality will absolutely matter. Um, but I want to temper that a little bit because there's also a, t a temptation for any institution to try to make the perfect mousetrap, the perfect offering with all the right supports, the highest quality thing you can conceive of at this point. And that could take forever, ultimately. The successes that you see from some of the bigger programs, Arizona State, Southern New Hampshire University, Western Governors even, is that once they begin to get some level of scale, you're able to learn and innovate and improve the model very rapidly, because now you have tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of data points on all the learning interactions that students have. So getting into the market, getting scale, I would argue is a way to improve your quality, but quality absolutely matters. You had a question. I have a question about the this graph and these numbers. So let's say I was a Missouri s and student, but I was from Illinois, and I decided that I had one class that I really wanted to take online at Columbia College. Am I fitting into this graph, or is that exclusively someone who's only online? No, this is, ex uh, the, uh, the, the definition of this is people that are essentially exclusively online, which I think means more than 75% of their courses are online. But, because you're right, in the, in the way that students generally live, as I said before, everyone's gonna take one online class somewhere, right, I would hope. And we should be servicing them doing that very, very well. But this is really looking at online, uh, predominantly online only enrollments. I have one question. No, no, go ahead. My question relates to the Purdue acquisition of Kaplan and it says uh, there's zero years in time to scale. Do you know how many of the 38.3 thousand students were Kaplan versus Purdue? How many were in the conversion? Uh, that count is the, the vast majority of those are historically Kaplan students, historically. Good. I'd like to give you a grade if, if we're about ready to close because yesterday we, we, I think we had a really good discussion, uh, but the one thing we said was uh, uh, you know, it's going to take a good while for us to get a quality program, know the market, be able to market, uh, and not to expect. But we want to plan tomorrow, and today's tomorrow. And actually what you gave us, 
uh, was a synthesis of what you heard and listened to. You gave us points that we didn't have tomorrow based on what, we, what was said. And I thought that was, that satisfies me for a plan for tomorrow. I thought that was well done. So what's the score? Talk to you tomorrow then. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, just the last question for me. When you look at the last slide, Arizona State currently has 25,000 students, but it took them eight years to build it. And Arizona State is basically a single university. We have four separate universities, and our programs with pockets of success exist on four separate platforms and four separate business models with different price points. So in order for us to achieve our objective, 25,000 new students, incremental students in five years, what are things that we can't do? What are things that we need to avoid to actually achieve that objective? Or put it another way, let's put it from a positive way. What are things that we need to do? Because it's a much more aggressive time frame than even Arizona State was able to achieve. Most institutions that have grown, institutions and systems that have grown relatively rapidly online have done so on the theory that you can create a more rapid rate of growth by separating those activities from the core business of running a university. Um, and there's all sorts of reasons for that. And academics have written about that as well. I don't want to stand here and say it, it can't be done within the four universities that you have today because you are doing great things there and we're just starting this project. We don't know what we don't know yet. But most institutions that have thought about this have said let's create an innovation arm, an additional campus, a, a new accredited institution. Let's buy something. Let's do something outside of our core academic processes in order to accelerate this quite quickly and then maybe over time integrate it back in. That doesn't exclude use of current programs and faculty, does it? No, definitely oh, not. Right. It, any other questions? Y yes, sir, Alex. Uh, I had a question about, uh, you came up with, the, I think it was 578 possible uh, people that would be interested. <clears throat> and you specifically mentioned um, focusing on bachelor and potentially some graduate certificates. I, I didn't hear you mention stackable certificates. Uh, you may have said it, I just didn't hear it. Uh, and then secondly, that the graph you showed with the distribution of people who are enrolled in which institutions they're enrolled in, do you have the comparable data that shows it by uh, degree program or area that they're enrolled in? Uh, we can. We haven't cut it for this purpose in that. Um, but so it, it, it would help us to figure out, is, are people Market outside, to, are they choosing to go outside because we don't have those? Uh, what are the areas? And then within the state, what's the demographics of the people that we're looking at? What areas are they currently in with their degrees? And if they're going to stack, how do we stack on top of those yeah. degrees? No, all very good questions that we'll, we'll um, take on as we get into the data and the analysis around this. Just on the stackable credentials piece uh, for a second, I think the initial thinking, but again, this could all evolve, the initial thinking is that stackable credentials at or you know, above the associate degree level seem like they could be very attractive to get people up to the bachelor's degree level. Starting from the no college credit up to the associate degree level feels like more of the category for community colleges or others. So that's, um, again, that's not a precise cutoff point, but that's the way it's been sort of thought about. But you can get that data for us. Yes. <coughs> Any other questions? Uh, thank you very much. I, I would add so that the board and, and, and the university community can understand this, and you mentioned this as generating revenue, and I always forget, but we had uh, Arizona State on our visit indicated that their net uh, uh, or margin was 30 to 40 percent in their online, uh, which provides enormous revenue opportunities to put back into things like research, which is what Arizona State does. 
Thank you very Thank much. Thank you all. Mr. Chairman, uh, I think that concludes the business of the uh, uh, Academic Affairs, Student Affairs Committee, and I'd ask for a motion to adjourn the committee. So moved. Is there a second? Second. We're moved and seconded that we adjourn the committee. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. Extensions? It's if, adjourned. If I haven't made it clear, we do recognize you as the faculty's favorite curator. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so I would like to go to uh, uh, the uh, Compensation and Human Resources Committee meeting, uh, Curator Phillips. Let me just flip my, my pages here. I, I'm beyond it. So we're going to have a, uh, this is an information item, not an action item, to talk about further changes to the retirement program that is offered throughout the system. And just a little... Uh, uh, background for the audience. Uh, years ago, we had what's called a defined benefit program. <clears throat> In the last, I guess, six or seven years, we've moved more toward including uh, defined contributions, uh, 401ks in private sector or 403bs, I think, for public institutions. And uh, we're moving along that road, and Marsha Fisher, who is the Vice President of Human Resources, has been working with faculty groups and administration uh, to uh, talk about what would be the next appropriate move, and so we're socializing it today. It will probably come up on the action item agenda in some form in February. So, Marsha? Thank you. Thanks. So we are talking about a proposed new retirement plan for future employees. And there's four things that I would like to uh, discuss with you today. The first are why have we undergone this evaluation and why are we recommending this change? Two, what's the process that we've gone through to evaluate this and come a bring a recommendation to you? What is the current recommendation? And then finally, we'll conclude with next steps for further vetting before bringing it to the board for an action item. So why this change? <clears throat> so we want to offer a retirement plan that the current workforce values so that we can attract and retain the best people. We know that new employees value portability and accessibility. The marketplace has largely moved to a defined contribution plan. And our blended plan that Curator Phillips spoke of is difficult for people to understand. And I think sometimes it's underappreciated because of that difficulty in understanding it. We also know that we want to make decisions now to protect the defined benefit plans for current employees and retirees. We've gone into greater detail at the board meetings, uh, specifically Vice President Rapp and our Chief Investment Officer, Tom Richards, regarding our current pension plan. Today, I just want to highlight for you that our current plan is 83% funded. Uh, that's relatively a well-funded plan. The national average is 73%. But do we do want to take actions that will stop increasing that unfunded liability? So the process. We've been working approximately the last year with the Total Rewards Advisory Committee. That's a committee that's made up of faculty, staff, and retirees. And I really want to take a minute to acknowledge them and thank them for their work. This is busy people who have full-time jobs, and we've asked them to work closely with us. And they have dug into the data, met with us in subgroups and full groups. And what I can tell you about them is it's a group of people who care very deeply about the faculty and staff, and they care very deeply about the University of Missouri. And a number of them had planned to attend today, but with the weather, I don't think uh, many have. I think we might have one person in the audience. Yes, you'll stand. 
Thank you. And for those that might be listening back uh, at their desk, thank you for the work that you've done. We've also worked very closely with a central work team made up of system leaders in finance, HR, investment, legal, as well as some outside consultants and vendors. And I would like to acknowledge two people, uh, Jessica Baker, our Director of Benefits, and Eric Vogelweide, the controller, uh, who, again, had intended to be here today, but because of weather, are probably listening in. And I want to acknowledge the good work that they've done. Uh, Marianne de Temple with Willis Towers Watson is here today, and she's helped bring us an outside perspective, helped us do some additional research and benchmarking, and we appreciate the partnership that we've had with her. So the Total Roads Advisory Committee, or TRAC, started off developing some principles and some philosophies before diving into making, a, um, starting to get into the details of a new plan, we looked at the principles of what it should look like and really ensuring sustainability and continuing to offer a retirement plan that attracts and retain employees were the top priorities. Their work included reviewing the two current plans that I'll go into just a little detail about in a couple of slides to give you some perspective, as well as looking at industry standards and trends and benchmark analysis for AAU Public, Urban 21, Rolla Custom Peer Analysis, uh, really dug into that data before starting their recommendations. So I show you this slide to give you an idea of our current two plans. The plan that's highlighted in the blue is our defined benefit plan. You'll notice that employees make a mandatory contribution, and in return, they're promised a benefit at the conclusion of retirement age that's based on a formula that's in, in the blue box, the 2.2 times the average five highest consecutive salaries times the service credit. The 2012 plan is the one that's a little complicated for people to understand. You'll note that the defined benefit portion, they make the same mandatory contribution, but they have a lower benefit multiplier. But instead, they have a, uh, a defined contribution portion, which the university contributes 2% core, and then matches up to 100% of 3%. And the vesting period I'll highlight for you is three years, and I'll highlight that we have an auto-enrollment to get the full benefit of 3%. That's not the easiest plan to explain to employees, and what we have found, people sometimes forget some of the value. They'll focus on the university matches 3%, but they may forget that the university is contributing that 2% core. So that was one of the things that encouraged us to look at evaluating our future plans. So I want to give you an idea of some of the benchmarking data, and I'll highlight for you in your materials that we went in, we put the tables of the actual schools, and so if you want to look at a specific school, you're able to do so. But let's look at the all public. So what we're showing you here is the employer contribution by percentage. And again, those tables are listed at the back, but you'll see there's a range of about 5 to 12 percent, with the majority of employers contributing 8 percent. If we look at the AAU public, again, you see the range of about 5 to 12 percent, with the majority of employer contribution being 8 percent. Urban 21, which is, the, is a comparator group that we often use for UMSL or UMKC, uh, it has the range of 5 to 12. You'll note on that that there's a majority at 9 percent, but 8 percent is still within a competitive range. And then finally, looking at Missouri S&T. You'll notice some additional covers on colors on the S&T graph. We've uh, differentiated for you that there are public institutions and private institutions in this particular benchmarking group. And when compared with the public groups, 8% uh, is, is in that competitive range. This was a little bit more limited of a comparator group uh, in the number of um, schools that we were able to get access for the information. So let's jump into uh, the recommendation. 
So the initial recommendation from TRAC is to introduce a new defined contribution plan to new employees hired at some future date. Right now it's, it's um, tentatively set at October 1. And then you would close the defined benefit plan for those individuals hired on or after that date. The specifics of the plan, I want to highlight three areas for you. First, uh, what's being recommended is a 100% match of up to 8%, a three-year vesting period, and you'll note in the 2012 uh, plan, it was also a three-year vesting period, and that we auto-enroll um, the full 8%. We found that when we auto-enroll people at a percent, 95% of people stay at or increase the amount of auto enrollment. So it, that's um, why we want people to get the full benefit of what we're offering. So we auto enroll them at that full maximum benefit. They can change that amount at any time, but we find that most people don't. And so that we're encouraging them to become retirement ready. I also note on this slide that the suggested total savings rate is 15%. If an employee takes advantage of the full match, they'll be saving at 16% and be retirement ready. So two of the elements of this recommendation were by consensus, the 100% auto enrollment rate and the three-year vesting. There was an alternative plan that was also considered, and it was debated among the track and had a split vote. Ultimately, this is the recommendation, but I would like to highlight for you the other option that was considered. They also considered a core contribution of 4% with a 50% match of up to 4%. Now, what you'll note is the university is still contributing 8%, and you'll also note that if an employee is to be retirement ready, they should be contributing the full 8% themselves. So why the recommendation of the 100% match versus the core plus a match? There was concern that employees might um, be misled or think that 4% was enough if that's what the university is contributing and they wouldn't be retirement ready. There was also concern that um, saying that you'll match up to 4% at a 50% rate might not seem as attractive to people. So they might not be as willing to um, put in their own money to get that match. And it's also, again, a little more confusing. It's pretty easy to say that, uh, pretty easy for people to understand the value when you say there's an 8% match um, of 100%. One of the concerns that I've heard raised by TRAC and others, how will this impact lower paid employees? Would they be at risk of not being able to do the full match? We pulled data to see if we could find some kind of trend of those folks who don't, who change the auto enrollment by reducing it. And what we were able to find is there's not really a pattern that relates to either the salary that someone makes or their type of employment, whether it be faculty or staff. So again, the data that we have shows that people tend to stay 95% of the time at the auto enrollment rate. Now I will note the data sh is, um, based on a 6% contribution. We didn't have data for a full 8%, but we believe that will, will be the, the um, we believe that'll be the same outcome. So that's the recommendation. Um, I do think uh, between the two core plus match or 100% match, it is a de debatable policy question. And we certainly, uh, it's our desire to bring forth a plan that will be the most attractive to employees and as we uh, attempt to attract and retain the best. So what's the next steps? Uh, well, let me recap here. So we've gone to, um, made presentations to system level representative groups that are listed on this slide throughout the months of September, October, and November. They've received a similar presentation to this, though I, we went into a little bit more on the finance side for those particular groups. And we've taken their feedback to adjust and provide additional information. And specifically, we got good feedback on providing some more date, data about the benchmarking. So timeline and next steps. Whoops, one more. Back. Oh, sorry. <laughs> there you go. So you'll see that we've done the work with track. 
Um, we've vetted with the system representative groups and now we're at the informational item for the Board of Curators. My next work is to go to the campus level uh, faculty uh, council and senates and these university level staff advisory groups and make the same presentation, get their feedback, see if they have any um, kind of pressure point, those two different options that we talked about. And then again, we plan to bring it to a formal vote to the uh, board in February. And again, I just want to reiterate for those that might be listening to this, it is um, a proposed new plan for future employees. It does not impact current employees. It does not impact current retirees. Uh, but we are looking to see what's the best plan that we can offer to attract the, the best uh, talent to the University of Missouri. So are there questions from anybody on the board? This, this is not the most exciting thing that comes before the board, but it may be as important as anything, certainly to the employees. I wonder, not hearing any questions, uh, part of this purpose is to publicly vet this and, and have reaction. We did have one of the task force or TRAC members present. Does anybody wish to speak to this? Um, either pro or con, any public comment. Uh, we don't, don't often ask for that, except this, this is maybe a good time if anybody feels like they're representing a group that likes it or doesn't like it. I do have a question, and I should have picked it up earlier in reviewing it, but I think one of your earliest slides said that the matching was 1% uh, up to $49,000 and 2% over $50,000? For the defined benefit plan. So that was just giving you some data of what the two current plans. I just, that just struck me as being regressive. Uh, uh, and I say that uh, because I'm not sure what the thought process is behind it. Uh, I suppose we can't change it uh, we may be locked into it, but maybe the Towers Perrin's uh, a person that's here because maybe a third or maybe more of our employees don't have earnings of more than $50,000. And so that's only matching the 10, the, the, the 1%. <clears throat> Whereas the higher paid employees would be able to and are eligible if they're earning $150,000 or more. Um, and, and so it, it sort of penalizes somebody with a low salary. Um, no, it, it, so this is the defined benefit plan. So it, it's saying actually somebody who makes less than 50000 would only donate the 1%. Whereas uh -huh. when you get higher than that, then you, did you, you wanna, donate yeah. to? It's the all your money. It's not, uh, it's not the money of the match of the university. It's, it's, okay. your, it's your mandatory contribution in order to receive the defined benefit plan. Yeah, that's it, why I'm not a benefits lawyer. John, the dean's up there. I think the dean's standing at the... Yes, yeah, so, so back, back, if you have comments, forget what I was asking, and now uh, go... I, th I think I understand. Okay. No, that, that, that's right. I think you, you've got it now. It's actually a, a progressive sort of contribution in that the higher paid employees pay more to, to uh, support the plan. Do you have anything to say about the, uh, the proposal that is moving forward? There was a, not a complete consensus. I think you meant unanimity, but, uh, but a majority favored what's being advanced. Any thoughts since you're on that committee? Uh, the committee is pretty clear that, that this is a, uh, overall a, an excellent idea for us to move forward in this way, that uh, new employees are looking for defined contribution plans more than defined benefit plans. It gives them more flexibility. If they match it, uh, they can really have a, a, a good nest egg for retirement. Um, the issue will become in, there might be some discussion in the future about whether uh, there's a core contribution by the university uh, or whether it's, it's a simply a, a matching process. But uh, so far, it looks like we're, we're looking at uh, a one-to-one -one match, uh, and we'll just see what the employees think. It wouldn't be a hard adjustment to make if, if we wanted to, to make it in the future. So I'm Chris Hagland, uh, Dean of Health Professions, by the way. So. And, uh, and Dean, um, was there any appetite in the committee 
if it was made elective that you could move out of defined benefit into what we're calling defined contribution that people would be interested if it were legally permitted? Was that, did that come up? It came up. Um, we've, we've had the questions asked and currently evaluating it. Would you be willing to answer that? Sure, <laughs> sure. So it, it has come up in, in track as well as all the, the vetting mm -hmm. system guide groups that we brought in. Really, we're evaluating in three ways. One, what can we legally do? Two, financially, what kind of impact would it have on the plans? And three, what kind of administrative burden? And can we take that on? Uh, but there have been some people that have asked the question. Thanks for your participation on, on the track group. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. Curator, I also noticed Provost Ramchan has... Oh, I, I was just going to say, coming from another system, I thought this plan was very generous, but it wasn't... Well, um, it's, it's complicated to understand if you're not a finance person, so simplifying it, which is, I think, some of what you're trying to do, would make it clear to everyone that this is an awesome plan, especially if you compare it to some other, uh, you know, peer groups. So I'm all for simplifying and sharing that message. So the 2012 plan is the one that's challenging to really recognize the full value. Exactly, and there's a lot of value in that. So there is. Any other questions? Marsha, we appreciate the work that you're doing and the way in which you're going about it, which is to involve administration and faculty as we move along. I think that's all that uh, the Human Resource Committee has. I think we're... Uh, you do not need to adjourn. Yeah, because yeah, we're... Right. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Curator Phillips and, and, and Marcia. Uh, now, uh, Curator Bernsick, uh, do you have a Finance Committee meeting? Thank you, Chairman. We have three, count them, one, two, three action items this afternoon. Uh, the first is a project approval relating to the Women's and Children's Hospital. Second would be uh, relating to the amending of the collected rules as it relates to procurement. And uh, the third is the fiscal year 2020 student housing and dining rates. Uh, Ryan Rapp will present uh, some information and then we will ask for you to vote on each of these um, action items. Thank you, uh, Curator Burnsick. Uh, for this first item, I don't have any slides. If, if you recall, when we did our uh, five-year capital plans that were approved this spring, the, uh, there was a, this is a repair and renovation project for the women's and children's exterior. At the time, the only reason we're bringing it forward now and not having it on consent, they were estimating it was 16 to $20 million. Um, this, this project's coming in at $26 million. It's, it is desperately needed by the hospital. They'll be funding it from their current reserves. Um, you know, I did ask them, I said, I'd like to see a project where we're estimating it's $30 million and it comes in at $26 million, but it always seems to go up once we get into it. But really, the project scope hasn't changed. They've just refined it uh, since we last presented that in April. So I'd ask if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Are there any questions for? Yeah, Ryan. What are the plans for philanthropy to reduce the total cost as it's being built? I, I, for this project, uh, I, I don't, I'm not aware of there being any plans for philanthropy. Um, not saying we can. I know we've typically been challenged to, to do this because this is really just replacing the skin and exterior of the current building. Um, but we can certainly work with them to understand if, if it's feasible. Might have been a cheap way to name the building if it costs $26 million, and it's now called current, currently Women's and Children's. I think um, Moon's question is one we ought to ask every time MU Health has a capital improvement, is, is there some opportunity here to leverage grateful patients who in most hospitals, particularly uh, academic or not-for-profit, uh, are, are major funders of capital improvements. And it has not happened on this campus to a great degree. So I think it's great to raise the question. I, I, I would kind of also refer to uh, uh, Curator Farmer this issue because it's just my opinion, but for all the great things that have happened at MU Health, uh, their philanthropy and development has been uh, really 
pretty bad compared to other academic hospitals. So I do have a question about how this is being financed, mm -hmm. and it, it will show my continued ignorance about to what extent money being spent by MU Health is generated by MU Health. We know that they're operating quite well. Uh, so is this money that is, I mean, we have a fiduciary obligation to approve or not approve, uh, but is this money that comes out of the, I think they call it the, uh, uh, the net uh, margin, in private industry you'd call it the profit, and uh, in recent years they've been generating a fair amount of net margin. So it, is this coming out of their net margin or is this something that we're approving out of general revenues or the state legislature? I should know that, but I don't. No, that's a great question. It, it is ultimately coming out of their net margin from their what they've generated as their capital fund reserves. Um, you know, that, that, I guess that's what I'm trying to highlight. This isn't a new building project. This is really just something that over a period of time, it, it's something they have to do and they need to do, and it is being fully funded out of, of their own capital reserves. Wouldn't it be great if somebody would contribute that, get a, a, a building net named, and, and then they could use that net margin for research and, and uh, discovery? in the future and you and we're not looking to you for that we're just making the point sir for, yeah I, there, I, there I actually may be a possibility for that now um, it's gonna take probably about a year year and a half for it to complete so I would say looking into that opportunity by the team I think it does make a lot of sense yeah I'm I mean, sure there are a lot of prominent people who were born in that hospital that have a lot of good memories of being treated there have somebody get some skin in the game. Including Ryan Rapp. You were born there? No, I was born in Boone Hospital. Boone Hospital. Oh, Boone Hospital. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> All right. Are, are there you, any other questions for Ryan about the Women and Children's Center? All right. If not, then can I get a, a motion and a second from the committee to approve the uh, project approval of the exterior building envelope replacement at Women and Children's Hospital? So moved. A second. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm supposed to ask if uh, everyone approves, say, on the committee, say aye. 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 Anyone uh, disapprove, nay? Any abstentions? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe um, we have uh, now passed the motion at the committee level, and we would like for You're you. making that motion. I'm making the motion for the full board to approve the motion we just moved to approve and approved. And do I, have, do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries, and there is project approval for the Women's and Children's <coughs> Hospital exterior building uh, as presented by uh, Ryan Rapp. Thank you. And next, we have the procurement rules. Yeah, uh, the, the next item up, uh, it is an action item, but I do want to spend some time going through a presentation. When the president did the State of the University address, we announced the Buy Missouri program. And I do want to kind of highlight what we're moving through. What we're really asking you today, though, as far as the action goes, is just to adjust our collected rules to allow us to move forward with the program. We've worked closely with the Office of General Counsel to, to, to do this. But I did want to highlight for the group what we're planning to do with the Buy Missouri program. Currently, we spend approximately $700 million in what I'll call addressable spend through our procurement operation. Um, the, the goal of the program is... We really want to work to support small and medium-sized businesses in Missouri. Um, where we can find value, we want to give them preference. Uh, our also, the other thing that we're not doing well today is actually tracking that, so we want to be able to track and report the spend we're doing with Missouri firms. We'd effectively roll this out at the beginning of the calendar year. This highlights the objectives of the program. Um, Really, at, at the end of the day, it is to grow spend at the university, but also expand these, our cooperative purchasing program to allow other public entities so other universities could participate in this. Um, and, and really at, drive more spend to those firms here in Missouri. As far as what the next steps are, um, 
we, today we would need approval to move forward with the changes to the CRRs. We would then expand our cooperative purchasing program. We'd also update how we look at our RFP scoring, and it would really give credit where we see value to Missouri businesses. Again, we are still looking for best value, but Missouri businesses could receive preference there. Um, another important step is we have a lot of different maintenance and repair operation suppliers. We, we have an e-procurement tool. Uh, it's called Show Me Shop. It's, I, I, we intend for it to look like Amazon. Does it look and feel like Amazon? Probably not, but you kind of get the concept of what that is. We want to see if we can get more Missouri firms on that tool um, where we can promote the purchase of supplies and materials through there. Um, the other thing that we'll be doing is going out across the state to promote awareness of the program, updating the website. Um, we'll also educate our internal staff, but also going out and working with suppliers and vendors across the state. And then what we want to be in a position to do is come back next year and report the spend with Missouri businesses. I'd welcome any questions um, you might have on the program. Fellas, anybody else? Yeah. Uh, do we have already any kind of a uh, female underrepresented or veterans preferences? Y yes, um, we, we've had that for a number of years. That's the only question I have. Any others? All right, if there are no further questions, uh, can I have a motion and a second from the committee to approve the amendment to collected rules and regulations section 80.010 as it relates to procurement? So moved. Second. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Was opposed nay. Any abstentions? Um, we have a uh, we have a unanimous vote, Mr. Chairman, on behalf of the Finance Committee. I now move for approval of the amendment to Collective Rules and Regulations 80.010 procurement for the University of Missouri system. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Uh, motion carries. Uh, thank you, Curator Burtonsick. Uh, there's one more. Yet, uh, yet for us to complete here in our action item list. I for, was not implying otherwise. Well, I, I didn't like think you I were. I, I just, you know, I want to be thanked, you know, at the end is my preference. Um, Ryan, would you please now introduce the fiscal year 2020 student housing and dining rates for MU? Sure. Uh, so typically we've brought these items in February. Uh, moving forward, we'll actually bring these for all campuses in the November, December meeting. The reason that we've done this, moved this up for MU is largely is we have a lot of um, off-campus student housing uh, in Columbia, and I think it's important that they have the ability to know what their on-campus rates are going to be for next year and, and allow to go ahead and move forward with marketing that to students. So that is why it's in front of you today. Um, I think um, we're continuing to keep our commitment to low-cost options. Um, last year, if you noticed, when, when we brought it in, we actually reduced the rates that we're charging. Um, even with this year, with the rates that we're asking to approve, we estimate that 83% of our students will pay less for next year. Um, and I do want to highlight for the group that we're currently at 94% occupancy. Um, we only have one dorm room that doesn't actually have students in it, and that's because it's actually an administrative building for MU Health right now. So I, with the rates that are before you today, I think it indicates that we're either not increasing those rates, in some case lowering those rates, and trying to make them more transparent for our students. Um, I'd welcome any questions the board might have on, on the rates that are here today. Do we know how these compare to other universities within and outside of the state? I, I, I'm, I'm looking to Vice Chancellor Ward to see. I, I know that, um, I, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I, I know we're competitive. Um, we certainly could get you some more analysis around that. Um, and, and part of what we're trying to make sure is we also remain competitive in Columbia. We are at or below, and we can get the board some specifics on that. Thank you. Does anyone, have any, does anyone have any questions for Ryan about the yeah. student housing and dining I have one rates? real quick. Uh, on your last slide there, I noticed on the room rates, you got a high of almost about $10,000 and a low of 6000 That's a $4,000 spread. How, how can the room rates be that much different? That's, I guess that's my question. 
largely driven by do you want to have a roommate or do you want to have a room to yourself? I see. That, that's what drives that spread. I understand the board because you got mm -hmm. different meal yep. options and so forth. Yeah, so you're you're not that's a if I want to have a single suite to myself and your low end is are you willing to live in one of our dorms with a roommate? Got it. Are there any other questions relating to the housing and dining rates for a meal? All right, hearing none, may I have a motion and sec and a second from the committee to approve the fiscal year 2020 housing and dining rates for a meal? So moved. Second. Uh, all those in favor on the committee, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Any abstentions? Uh, it appears we have, Mr. Chairman, a unanimous vote. Uh, would you, I, I make a, a motion to the full board now to approve the fiscal year 2020 student housing rates for MU. Any second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Move to adjourn. Um, motion to adjourn the. Can I do that or do I have to ask the committee? That's a good question for the parliamentarian. I'm moving to adjourn the Finance Committee. Could I get a second? A second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. Any abstentions? Mr. Chairman, we have adjourned the Finance Committee. Curator Bernsick, I was keeping a careful look, and you brought it in 30 seconds under time. <laughs> so, uh, Curator Farmer, I hope you can live up to that sort of performance. Thank you, Chairman. We are right on time. Uh, today, the External Affairs Marketing and Advancement Committee has three information items. Um, the last time we met, we had Mizzou and s and present on their marketing strategies. In this meeting, um, we're going to have UMSL and UMKC speak today. So with that, I'd like to invite Bob Samples, if he is in the room. Um, Bob is our Associate Vice Chancellor and Director of Communications at UMSL, and he's going to give us a review of the latest marketing communication efforts. Uh, thank you very much. Very proud to be here. I want to tell you that uh, marketing communications at the University of Missouri-St. Louis, our current formation, we started creating this office about eight years ago. What our, our goal was to create a centralized internal agency doing public relations, marketing, and web. And uh, so I'm going to go through that. We have 18 people, including myself, on staff. That pretty much represents almost everybody on campus doing this type of activity. Uh, I know in our sports information office, we have one person. There's one person in optometry and there's one person in the alumni office. So we're a fairly lean, centralized university when it comes to marketing and communications. Uh, our mission, uh, we integrate all our activities. So we combine our advertising, our public relations, our events. We bring those all together to create an enhanced brand awareness, the institutional reputation. We support student recruitment and fundraising, and that, that is our mission. Our goals. Several years ago, we had different goals. When we used to be just a news bureau, we would count clips. And that's part of our dashboard now, I understand. But what we did was we took a different approach when we started to reorganize our office, was to look at the larger strategic goals of the university. And obviously, the thing that we work on is top-level brand awareness. Uh, and then we work on messaging and supporting other units doing the same thing. We're trying to drive awareness, attention towards student recruitment, fundraising, and uh, those are the kind of things that we work on. We do track news clips. You'll see that in the dashboard. Uh, but we don't have a formalized news bureau anymore. Now we have a PR content team. Uh, but I think in the dashboard, you see, we, we, we track 2,600 uh, traditional media uh, hits in this quarter. And we also uh, get thousands of social media hits, and those are kind of retweets, repurposes of online copy. Uh, one of the things that we did that I'm very proud of is about seven years ago, when we switched from a news bureau to be a content team, we, just, we freed up our writers to write differently. And I always call these common success stories. So a lot of times what we do when we just focus on being a news bureau is we try to write a news release that attracts some type of attention from an external source. And it usually has to be unique. 
the 94-year-old individual that gets a degree, something like that. But that's not what we do, and that's not really what we do at the University of Missouri-St. Louis day in and day out. We have common success stories. We recruit students, good students from different backgrounds. We do stories on them coming here. We do stories on their activities while they're here. We do stories on them in internships. We do stories on them when they graduate and when they get jobs. We do stories on our faculty. They're common success, new programs that they've started. Not all these things are tremendously newsworthy to a reporter, but they are great stories for parents and students who are looking for that type of experience at a university. And by creating this content, we then use it to repurpose, not through the channels that we control in our office, but also the schools and colleges put it on their website. We funnel that through the CRM. And the admissions office then shares this story as they go out. And I often preach to our, our development officers, and they do a great job of this, and our alumni office. They take those stories and share those stories with people they know who have interest in this. And that creates that affinity and shows our value as an institution. So that's, that's really what we, we refocused on. We have four people on our content team for the whole university, four, four writers. And it's 400 articles plus a year and UMSL monthly, which is our, I call that the best of UMSL daily. We send once a month to all the alumni. We have three current designers. They do over 400 projects a year. Those go from flyers to booklets advertisements, there are internal designers, but they all do a lot of high-end pieces. They do all our recruitment pieces, including our view book, and they do UMSL Magazine. And I'm gonna brag about that one for a second because it just won a grand gold from the Case Award. We do not have a standalone publication office. We do two magazines a year almost on the side. We write it in-house, we design it in-house, we have one photographer for the whole campus, he shoots it. The only thing we use out of house is a printer. We send it to a printer in Fulton, Missouri, same place that uh, Mizzou sends their magazine, and, and it's sent out. And so we're very happy with that. And if it hadn't have snowed, we'd have a brand new magazine in your hand right now uh, coming from Fulton. It'll be here tomorrow. Uh, and, and the theme of the new magazine is We Transform Lives, which is, of course is the sub-theme for our new mission statement, which we're very proud of. And it, it's a people edition, and we have 26 different stories of lives we transformed. And so we're pretty excited about that. Um, social media, uh, a lot of uh, universities have social media departments. Uh, we don't. One person on our content team oversees our main channels. And uh, as you can see, we have 27,000 social engagements quarterly. Uh, so we're doing a pretty good job there. Uh, if you were asking me, could we invest more? I'd love to invest more in that and some different strategies there, but that's, a, that's one of our weaknesses. Um, web services. Uh, when we took over and decided we were going to be an in-house agency, our web pages were controlled by uh, ITS. And they were uh, decided to turn those pages over to us, the top line pages. And uh, for about seven years, we've been controlling about 10% of our top line web pages. We create the, the, the templates for other units and we train the other units and individuals who then become sub-site managers. And we're also involved in the CRM the Slate product, which I know is Project Unify, uh, we do the emissions tracks for them, the communication tracks, and that's the first line of delivery to students who uh, apply and make inquiries into the university. UMSL brand advertising, that's usually when people talk about marketing, they really a lot of times are talking about advertising, and that's what a lot of people notice. And uh, we do it in an integrated approach. So when we take on a campaign, we tend to do outdoor, television, radio, print, and digital and I'll break down those a little bit and uh, bring that to different projects depending on the price point for the campaign. Our brand proposition is serious education, serious value, and we derived that after some research that was done for us uh, eight years ago by Simpson Scar Scarborough, their national firm. And it really gets back to serious education means that no other university in this region combines those two things better than the University of Missouri-St. Louis. And it gets back to quality at the price point. There are other good universities in, in this region, but they don't have the same price point we do. There might be some cheaper options, but they don't bring the same quality to the table. So that really is our brand proposition. And about seven years ago, we started with the I Chose UMSL campaign, and that became a campaign theme. 
And we have been running with that campaign for seven years as we have built a lot of brand equity with it, but we have changed it up over the thing. It started, as you can see at the top, it really started as a showcase for our alumni. The thing that we wanted to reinforce for the St. Louis public was that we educate St. Louis. And we just don't provide the workforce, we provide the leadership in the workforce. Sandra Van Trees, Ameren, Express Scripts, different places. We are at C-suite levels, superintendents. We have 11 superintendents in this region that came from this university. So we're very proud of that. And then we also kind of moved the campaign along and started to show how the outcomes for students were. And as you can see on the third board there, and we did do some subgroups and marketing in different regions here to reach different populations. And then this uh, summer, we did brag about our 100,000 graduates which was just a great deal for us, uh, as the chancellor talks about that and brag about that probably in his presentation. <coughs> Our current campaign that we're running is a high-level brand campaign. We had started at the institutional level. We have now started to try to brand our colleges through our overall branding. We did, in the spring, we did business and we did nursing. We're currently running advertisements and billboards and different kind of pieces uh, focusing on education and the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, I'm not gonna read through all this, but it, it's a multi-piece board. But I did wanna show you a, a little bit of the television creative uh, that we, we have up for that. The best thing about teaching is getting kids excited about learning. You should choose Umsla because it provides you with a wealth of opportunities for internships. It was financially responsible. They're also solving real issues that we're having in education. I'll always be grateful to Umsla for giving me the tools to help change people's lives. My name is Paul Hussman. Stephanie Madison. Miranda Ming. I'm a school counselor. I'm a science teacher. I'm an associate principal, and I chose Umsla. I chose AMSO for the College of Arts and Sciences. It enabled me to have a job now that is very fulfilling. I continue to have opportunities to network with alumni. AMSO helped me to follow my passions more effectively. We look for talent out of the AMSO pool of graduates quite frequently. My name is Lauren Collins. Tim Hebel. Yvonne Dickinson. I am a practicing attorney. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a cybersecurity analyst and I chose AMSO. I'm also very proud of our digital and our video production. We do not have in-house video services. One of the few things that we go out of house for is a shooter and an editor, but we produce the concepts and the creative is all produced by individuals in our unit. And they do all the logistics. They chase people around and say, please come to the shoot. Uh, the board a few years ago expanded our uh, in-state tuition to all Illinois. And uh, in support of that, we have been doing digital ad advertisements there. And on the Metro East, we just have launched a, another camp billboard campaign. And this kind of represents uh, 18 different billboards along the interstates on the Metro East, but also in the towns. We pick some of the larger uh, towns. So you have billboards that it, they have high, uh, state highways that go through the towns, little towns. And so we built those billboards there. So I wanted to point that out. And, and the reason I wanted to bring this to your attention because in-state tuition has helped our enrollment. This fall, we set a record for new freshmen from out of state. New record, and most of those come from Illinois, so we're pretty proud of that. Other thing we do is uh, we support, in many other ways, uh, direct events that the admissions office uh, host. Two of those are UMSL Day. This Saturday, we have UMSL Day. It'll be over in the Two Hill, which you'll be later in tonight and we'll have about 800 people there. We do a lot of digital activities, radio, uh, and, and the, you can kind of see that's, that's a little bit of what's ongoing. As you'll notice, you're not seeing any of this because you're not targeted, but it's, it's targeted for the 16, 17, 18 year olds. And uh, as I said, we expect 800 people there and we're pretty excited about that. Uh, there, there has been some mention about uh, uh, geo-targeting and, and advertising. We've been doing that for about six or seven years. And, uh, and if you have any questions about how we do it, uh, Justin Roberts is, is here. He's our, our director of digital and web services and, uh, and general director of marketing and communications. And I didn't do that, but we've been doing that for about eight years and we do that mostly in-house. And what this is, basically you can see they had a Southeast Missouri Regional College Fair and we target the site and then devices around there. 
And some of the creative there is what shows up on those devices, you know, and it kind of tracks and follows you around. And, uh, you know, and of course the goal is to get you to come to our booth while you're there and talk to our missions officers. Uh, we always talk about ROI and that's what the dashboard is about, is, is really looking at return on investment in different ways. But we do that also, we do that through different kind of surveys. We do a, a brand positioning survey and some of the results are the highlight there. The last, we did one in 2014, we did one in 2016. We're scheduled to do another one within the next six months and we haven't figured the date yet. But really what we're looking at to see is our message correct and is our brand improving? And, and it's kind of a high-end thing, and, and, and we, we hire an external firm to do that, so it's, it, it, you know, that we're getting the thing. And as you can see, we had a nine-to-one positive rating that, that our brand was being perceived better. I mean, so just some of this that stuff tells you that we have the right message, we, we're hitting the people the right way, and, 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 I, and I go back to the thing about our, our alumni success is an advantage, and it really comes back to one of the things that's special about UMSL in this region is our students become successful alumni. And that's something that resonates with our students and with parents. And I think, uh, and I did want to mention, we also do internal messaging survey. We, we check with students uh, and, and current students and see if our messages are resonating with them or they think they still resonate with individuals in our age group. We also do a media preference survey. And that's something we did a few years ago and we're, and we're currently doing another one. And that really gets back to see if people use Twitter, how they're receiving uh, Instagram or uh, Facebook and, and how, they, how our audience uses those or, or receives those so that we're not putting resources where people aren't. And, and so we do that. So we, we do a lot of different kind of tracking. And uh, like a lot of groups, we, do a, we, we start to push the envelope and we see if it works. And if it doesn't work, we go back and we try something else. But the one thing we do encourage, and, and, and we get a lot of encouragement from the Chancellor and Leadership Group here, is to really try to be on the cutting edge as best we can and not to be afraid to fail and, and learn from our failures, but also learn from our successes. And we learn from other successes. And, and I will say this in Curator Farmer, uh, as Ann follows me up from UMKC, we get a lot of information from the other campuses and vice versa. We do talk a lot and, uh, and ask, have you seen this work? Someone suggested this. And, 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 and we also ask about vendors. Have you seen this vendor before? So there is a lot of cooperation. So I did want to point that out. And that's all I have. Any questions? I've got a question on the last slide. It looked like um, of the people whose opinions of UMSL had changed recently, the response was higher. Is that all of the responses are nine favorable to one unfavorable or just the people whose opinions have changed? Or do we, ha do we know what the general consensus is in terms well, of Well, like the, 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 that was everybody's opinion. Okay. So it, it basically came up, you know, there was, there was some movement this way, but it, it, was, it was moving up a lot more. That's great. And do we know why um, it's so much more favorable now if we had the sort of, it sounds like we've had this campaign for the last seven years? We, we started, the, power? we basically started the campaign in 2012. So you see in 2014, it was about two years. Then we, this data is from 2016. As I said, we're about to, to do another survey to see if we're still moving up. A lot, a lot of brand building is repetition. And, and, you know, and you get into policies, you get into things. You, the more money you have, the quicker you can move somebody's perception. You know? And we do have a limited budget, and we hit them in a different way. So one of the reasons we have really not moved off of I chose UMSL, besides our alumni love it, is that we're, we're penetrating and we don't know that we have enough money, enough time to pivot and change that. Uh, but as I said, when we do the next survey, if we, we see some things changing, we may make some adjustments based on that. This looks really great. I, I do appreciate it very much. I, like, I love what you're doing. Uh, what, and I like that you're testing things and getting the data and making decisions. What percent of your budget would you say is going toward, you know, YouTube, Instagram, more the digital? I mean, is that 50, Just, is that much? five? About 30%. Yeah, and that, that switches a little. And, and a lot of times it depends on the campaign and our overall budget. Uh, some years we've, we've launched some programs, so we've had more money that there was more or less one-time campaigns, and you come back. So some of that adjusts a little bit. Uh, 
the current campaign we just kicked off, we're, sometimes we lean more towards radio, towards TV, or digital, depending on you know, the budget we have at hand. Thank you. <clears throat> so about a year and a half ago, we retained a consultant to help uh, the MU campus because of the decrease in enrollment. And I can't remember the name of it. it it's a number, what? 60 over 90. 60 over 90. 160. 160 over 90. Heart attack. And seemingly successful, uh, the enrollment has come up and one might think cause and effect. We've also brought in a new communications vice president or director. Chief marketing. Chief marketing. The communications and marketing. Um, who, who is system wide. By the way, a lot of really good things here, as Jeff has said. I uh, really commend you for that. Uh, I think we were talking about using that 160 over 90 uh, on other campuses once we had used them on MU if they were really effective. Uh, have you had that available to you? Uh, or is there still a, th first of all, were they as effective as they appeared to have been? I'm looking for Moon for that. So based on the increase in enrollment and the sentiment, yes, they were very uh, effective. Mm -hmm. um, but also at the other campuses, we did see, even without the use of 160 over 90, increases in application. And I think partly that's due to the common app. Uh, but I know that Cameron is in conversations with the other chief marketing communications officers about ways that we can support their needs centrally as well. But the only thing about 160 over 90 is that it was a very expensive endeavor, uh, about $1.3 million for the engagement as well as ad buys that we had to do. Well, I thought, I thought they did a good job from what you know, I could see like anybody else could see billboards in and video. The other thing that came out, and maybe it was Chief Farewell, is that how we refer to you? Uh, was the, the importance and the extent of the use of social media. And as we get better in e-learning and technology, uh, the ability to analyze it. So you had two different slides here, one on social media and one on web services. So you are gathering the information. I don't know the difference between CMS and C, CRM, but... Uh, uh, I guess I hope that in the future we not only have the data, but we're able to do that data an analytics that is not cheap, but once you learn how to do it and have people that are capable are able to mine that data for enrollment and for success and all sorts of other things. Sounds like you're the person that is in the trenches gathering that, and I hope that from a system standpoint we can assist each of the campuses. And, uh, Curator Phillips, I think that's part of the, the dashboard that is going on and that we're trying to streamline the data collection across the four universities and be able to better analyze performance and, and have cross-communication and shared learnings. And that's partly what this committee is trying to accomplish. That's okay. great. So, Jamie, if you see, like, the you know, digital's really working at UMSL, it's not like the other universities wouldn't figure it out, but it's kind of a share where you're saying, hey, we're really getting results here and things like that. I, I think so, and I think that Cameron can speak to this more because she is really spearheading this and making sure that the chief communications officers across the four universities are talking and sharing. And, and we, you know, whether the dashboard that we've created is the exact right one, at least has us all trying to boil down and talk succinctly about the performance on, on certain metrics. I, I, I think I'm going to jump in because. I mean, I love digital. I don't do it myself. Justin and team does it a lot better than I do. I think the key that we have latched onto, and I think the other campuses do too, is the integrated. You know, when you do television or you, or, or you do print or you, or you do radio or you digital, they, they drive you, they drive people and touch them, that frequency of different touches and to drive them to act. And, and that's what we want. We want the applications, we want the admits, and then we want the enrollment. So, uh, so all those things combined are, are, are what makes it effective. So I don't think it's just one. If we just relied on one, we probably would fail. And the other thing, I, I want to throw a shout out to our admissions office. I mean, our marketing 
is to supplement their strategies to recruit students. I mean, so the marketing office, and, and the president is right, we had an, an increase on our campus of new students. New student enrollment was up in Umsel this fall, you know, in a, in a tough enrollment market. And so, so we're pretty happy about that, but I think it's that integrated approach, you know, and, and trying to figure out what the mix is and how to do that, you know, and, and, that, and, and I'm sure you hear that from everybody else, but it really is trying to know that, that we need an integrated approach. Questions? Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Anything else? From, any other questions? Okay, up next we have uh, UMKC's Vice Chancellor of Strategic Marketing and Communications, Ann Spinner. Ann. Hello, glad to be here today. And I want to thank my friend Bob for bringing in the few inches of snow for my first visit to UMSL. <laughs> it was a great drive down I 70 today. So I want to start with a little bit of a story about UMKC's marketing and communications uh, uh, division. I think uh, the, each campus does their, their marketing and communications are organized a little bit differently. UMSL and UMKC are perhaps the closest in terms of, of the way that we serve our campuses. Um, at UMKC, we've been moving toward shared services since I came here seven years ago. Um, at that time, um, I merged three entities into one, and we became a central agency serving the entire campus, including our uh, central administrative needs, but also each academic unit and, and support unit. As part of that transformation, I worked with my newly merged team to develop a mission and values statement for MCOM, and it all centers around one core element, which is storytelling. So we tell UMKC's story with pride, passion, and personality. And we do that through marketing, through communications, through our website, uh, through, all the, through social media, through all the things that we have at our command. Um, underneath that, our values are to think strategically to advance the brand, we want to deliver great customer service by being responsive, flexible, and collaborative. We want to provide seamless, integrated marketing and communications. We want to be problem solvers and, and to do that with creativity and inspiration. And we want to build positive relationships both within the campus but also within the community. So on July 1, we went full throttle into shared services. So we had a couple pockets across campus that, were, that still sustained their own staffs and were not part of our coordinated UMKC marketing and communications effort. So on July 1, all full-time marketing and communications people at UMKC became part of MCOM, the shorthand name for our division. And we organized those, uh, those professionals into four different areas. We do marketing services, we do digital services, strategic communications, and creative services. So uh, as we pulled in some new people, we also overall the campus um, it sh it shrank its marketing and communication staff. We had some streamlining that went on there. Um, but we also were able to reorganize in a way that allowed us to beef up some areas that were really critical to the campus's functioning, um, namely marketing services and digital. So we, uh, we are responsible for the look and feel of our website and for all the content and uh, programming that goes into those pages. Not the IT um, behind the scenes stuff, but all the things that would face the public. So as you might imagine, we have quite a lot of uh, requests for projects from across the campus, and we really try to focus that on four strategic areas. Um, number one is student recruitment and retention. Secondly, we wanna raise positive public awareness of UMKC. We want to promote and build support for key strategic initiatives that the chancellor might have or research would be one of those. And then, of course, we're involved in friend raising and fundraising. But we do that, as you can see in this chart, with UMKC-wide projects and also with unit-specific projects. So t back to that top priority, or digging in a little more deeply on that, our number one marketing focus is undergraduate recruitment. That is where we put the vast bulk of our effort in terms of marketing um, for UMKC. We are very lucky to have a pro bono partner, Bernstein Rain, which is a nationally known advertising agency that happens to be based in Kansas City. Um, Steve Bernstein, uh, our partner, happens to be a UMKC alum, and they just are big supporters of, of Kansas City and civic engagement. 
So we create all of our own campaigns and do all of the creative and, and work for that, but they do our media buying. We can take ideas to them and have them vet them and tell us if, they, um, if that's gonna be the best bang for our buck. So it's a great partnership. Um, and with them, we built a, an integrated campaign, and you can kind of see how we spend our money in our paid media channels. It is a wide range of things. It includes outdoors, so billboards and things like that. It includes paid social, um, display ads, search ads, uh, video, and digital radio. Um, that's our current mix. That changes a little bit every year, depending on what new tactics might be out there or what things are happening in the marketplace. And those percentages can adjust based on what's successful or what's, what we see needs to be tweaked a little bit. So in addition to those paid media channels, we are uh, amplifying our campaigns on all of our in-house or own channels. So our UMKC websites, our own social media channels, through photography, through website development, through video production management, and through partner media. This is our current campaign. We started the place for people going places in 2014. Um, we're in our fifth year of that campaign, and it, the, the idea is that we have people coming from many different places who all merge on our campus, and they're all looking to succeed and go places. And this campaign has resonated tremendously with our prospective student audience. And the campaign throughout has featured you know, real people from our campus, Yes, in, in each year, we tweak it a little bit. We've been growing a little bit more towards showing the environment of our campus because all of our research shows us that the things that attract people to UMKC that make us distinctive are uh, one, that we have a very diverse campus, that urban setting, so location, um, not just a location in Kansas City, that's one of them, but also location within Kansas City, being in a uh, kind of a green area in the middle, in the heart of the city. Um, we also have um, a lot of contact with faculty, and they <coughs> like that connection with faculty. So there are some things that we hit throughout the campaign that really resonate with our students that are also the key distinctive factors for our campus. This year, we took that campaign a little bit different direction, and we focused on young alums, people who've been out two or three years, who've gotten great jobs, so it's a testimonial to what you can do with your UMKC degree. The results of this have been pretty awesome. Anecdotally, um, I've heard some great stories from students, including one from our recent past student, um, student government president who was in India and saw one of our ads online, and that's why she chose to come to the United States to go to school at UMKC. Um, we had 17 million impressions throughout all the digital channels. <coughs> Back on that wheel at the beginning, you could see that most of our tactics are digital because that's where our 17 to 24 year old audience is spending most of its time. We also have two million plus eyeballs a week. Eyeballs is a great term for how they measure uh, billboard reach um, throughout the Kansas City metro area. And the enrollment shows where some of our key growth areas have been. Um, I'm especially excited about Texas and Nebraska. Those are areas where we just started the Heartland rate. They're under our new Heartland rate. Um, Wichita area was up 20%. That's where our new Kansas rate might be kicking in. And we also saw growth in the St. Louis area and Columbia area. Our FTC uh, enrollment was up slightly this year, and it, we had our biggest FTC class ever um, the year before, so we are definitely seeing some positive <coughs> impacts of the campaign in our uh, marketing efforts. And you can see it again in this chart where we, we when we have all these ads out in different channels, uh, we want people to take an action and come to our landing page and either apply or visit um, or seek more information. And you can see our year-over-year -year results have just been going up and up. And in fact, by September 30th this year, we already had more, um, more people come to our campaign landing page than we did the entire year before. All right, so that was the paid side of our undergraduate campaign. We also do a lot of brand storytelling um, in our own channels, and as soon as we developed this campaign, we realized we could tell some great stories about the awesome young people who choose to come to UMKC. And we developed a student storytelling project, and so far we've done 200 plus profiles of students, and they are on our website, but we also use them in social media channels. We tweet them, we Facebook them, we Instagram them. When Vine was a thing, we had little Vine videos out there. 
So we have a great database of stories about people who come to UMKC, um, and if, if we have a prospective student looking at us, they'll find someone there that reminds them of them, and that's what we're aiming for. But after we launched the student storytelling, we realized we also have some great faculty here, and we hear about them so much from students that we developed the dynamic duos piece of this storytelling project and we do stories on faculty um, student mentor pairs and that's a great way to both showcase our faculty but also highlight for prospective students our undergraduate research and the great mentoring and advising they can get at UMKC. And then the third leg of that, we started a year later, was our alumni storytelling. And again, we're focusing on alums who've been out about two to five years, talking about what they've done with their degree. So great personal testimonials that show the value of UMKC. These are some of our storytelling stories, and we turned them into Instagram pieces. Um, so we got, we, with each student, we basically have an open call um, several times a year and we invite any student who wants to come in to tell us their story. We photograph them, we interview them, we video them, and then we use those photographs and that material throughout the rest of the year in different ways throughout our website, throughout um, even the poll banners on our campus and even on our billboards. But we've come to the end of going places, so it's time to build our next campaign, and we are in that process right now. We just finished the first phase of our research um, about a week ago, and we did focus groups in Wichita, Omaha, um, St. Louis, and Kansas City, and um, we really got to hear from prospective students, but also from some current students in Kansas City about what, what UMKC means to them, what resonates with them. Uh, we're going to go into a quantitative research phase here in the next month, and then we'll be going back to test positioning statements in January, and then we'll begin building our new campaign, which will launch in August 2019. And with that development, we'll, we'll be doing new commercials, new messaging, new advertising plan. So lots to look forward to in 2019. We also do quite a bit with graduate program marketing, and I want to just highlight a couple that have been very successful for us. School of Nursing and Health Studies has a renowned online nursing degree program and master's and doctoral level, and we um, partnered with uh, an outside vendor, FSC Interactive, for this campaign, and we've had great results. It's helped us grow enrollment there. Uh, we've had an, an increase in conversion 20% year over year, which means more and more people are seeing the campaign and taking action based on what they've seen. And our block school management is another place where we've seen some really successful uh, recruitment development through our, our marketing programs. Uh, we began a digital marketing program for a professional MBA, which was a new version of that type of program that we launched last year. We do it with our EMBA. We do it with some of our masters, such as accounting and finance. And also this year, we did a complete rebrand of our block school management. We have a new dean, and uh, we decided to change things up a little bit but first the PMBA. So we launched a new program that was a mix of hybrid and in-classroom, and you can determine the level of hybrid or in-classroom. You could take it all hybrid, you could take it all online, you could take it all in-classroom. You get to choose how you want to um, arrange that. And we came up with an ad, ad campaign, Your Degree on Your Terms, and we began marketing that in February 2018, and by August we had increased class enrollment 400%. So very excited, it surpassed all expectations for enrollment for that program. And I just saw some data last week that uh, the students actually are loving the program and giving us great reviews on, on how uh, the, the curriculum was set up. So do you think it was the hybrid nature of the program that drove the increase of 400%? I do, I think there are two things. It, we, the hybrid nature of it and we also um, were able to, not, every, not everybody had to take the GMAT so I think those two things together allowed us to really open that up and creating a really clear way to explain that because hybrid can mean a lot of different things to people. Um, but we had some really clear um, graphics and marketing messages. What, that what is 400%? What is the class size? It's 107, 150, I'm sorry, 150 this year. 
So, oops, on our rebrand, um, we have a well-known business school, but we wanted to increase brand awareness in the area. Our two main competitors in the market are um, have the same colors as us. So when you drive around town and you see uh, business school billboards, you see a lot of blue. So in, in working with Trezolo Marketing Agency, we came up with the idea of uh, building, um, this is a color that's really present in our new block school of management, if you've ever been in that building, and we decided to build uh, a campaign element around that. And um, we came up with a tagline, we are Kansas City's business school, kind of obvious, and yet, that's the space we want to claim. It's also great from an SEO, SEM perspective because when people are looking for a business school in Kansas City, we will come up to the top. Um, so we built a campaign that has many elements. I'm just highlighting a couple here. We did billboards. We've got bus wraps out there. We're doing digital ads. We also have built this, this um, community engagement piece of the, of the rebrand, which includes a four foot by four foot acrylic block that we take to student events, to community events, to business events, and we build a social media campaign around it and really engage with people so we get them talking about the block school. It's been a lot of fun. And last but not least on uh, one of our unique aspects is we have a marketing partnership with Sporting Kansas City. So that's been a great win for us. They are a rising Kansas City brand. We consider ourselves a rising Kansas City brand. They have a very young, diverse following, and when we market to to and through Sporting Kansas City, we're reaching um, a very diverse audience, a lot of Hispanic, a lot of African American, a lot of um, the age range for people who watch that sport is about like 12 to 36 or 40. It's, it's a nice range for us in terms of recruitment. They also have some great pipeline programs. They're in every school district in the region uh, with youth programs, so we have a way to build a pipeline to UMKC. And in fact, they're partnering with us right now to bring some youth soccer camps to our campus. So we'll have that sort of middle school age group coming to UMKC um, to experience what, it, what our campus is like and to work with our athletics folks. Uh, we do UMKC Day at Sporting KC once a year, and we also get to see Sporting KC on our campus a lot. They bring players to our Welcome Week events. They bring some of their other partners like McDonald's and the Roastery to bring coffee to our students or to test new products. So it's been um, a really great partnership. The next six months, I have a new <coughs> chancellor who really believes in the power of marketing. And we're going to try to touch on some areas that we have sorely been in need of. We're going to broaden our undergraduate recruitment to, to have a greater community engagement campaign aspect. So we, we really haven't spent much money going after influencers and, and community folks because <coughs> they're in different channels, much more expensive channels than our 17 and 24 year olds. So we're looking at that. We are going to be promoting a new scholarship. You may have heard about our new Casey Scholars program last week, and we may have another uh, thing or two up our sleeve in coming months. Uh, we also need to be more dedicated in our promotion of the Kansas rate and the Heartland rate, so we, got, we have plans in the works for that. We're building budget for that. And uh, last but not least, we're going to be changing our website on December 3rd. We are long overdue for a website overhaul. We've been technologically hampered by not having a content management system, but through the work of uh, Barb Bickelmeyer when she was interim chancellor and with Chancellor Agrawal's support, we were able to get approval for a new content management system, which is allowing us to move forward with a much better looking, well-branded, consistent, um, accessible website. So this is your sneak peek today of what's coming on, on the week of December 3rd. And that's it, questions? I thought that was a great presentation. Uh, it was beautiful, too. All your slides look so great, and I hope um, you've enjoyed putting it together. Do we have any other questions from you all? I would ask one real quick. Yeah, yeah. yeah just again, I will, I will agree. I think it looks wonderful. Uh, two in a row, just marketing looks really outstanding. Um, I asked them about UMSL, and they said about 30% was what I would call social digital. And I know you broke out in here, it says social's nine. But if I were to say, you know, Snap and, uh, you know, Snapchat, Instagram, but also like Pandora, Spotify, I mean, you have a idea of what, you know, just paid, what you would so guess. I think budget. if you add up a couple of those, so paid social is nine, but that video in digital radio, 
So if you, it's, uh, yeah, it looks like it's pretty close to 30. It's a little above 30. 30. So right in that range. Yeah. And we also do lots in social that's free. I mean, we, we boost our own posts sometimes. I mean, it, for minimal amounts of money, we what, can self-market. <laughs> right. No, that's what I would like to ask yeah. about. What kind of, when you boost, you know, you get a nice post and you're getting some reaction, you boost it. Uh, what have you found? I mean, is that... Is that pretty helpful? Pretty uh, it, it can be enormously helpful. So we, the student storytelling project that we do, we put in all of our social channels, and you know they'll get 500 to 1,000 um, um, hits or likes. Um, but if we boost it, it'll be 15,000 or 20,000. It doesn't cost much. And it costs like 40 bucks a time. Yeah. So. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Can I <clears throat> make a comment? Sure. Uh, sporting Kansas City. I didn't realize that we were partnering. That's a home run. Uh, having originally been from St. Louis, I've always thought of St. Louis as the soccer town, actually in the Midwest. But Kansas City has really embraced soccer. Plus, that's that's one of our sports on our it home is. campus. So I really compliment you for that. <coughs> I, I really, really think it's great. It, uh, gives me an idea, and I see Tom George sitting in the back of the room, standing in the back of the room, uh, to partner with something that is explosive. Uh, gosh, isn't chess becoming pretty explosive in St. Louis? Anyway, I just thought I'd mention that. Okay, hey, thank you. All right, thank you. Sorry, this is a long information list. Um, our third item is uh, the UM Council for Advancement <coughs> Report, which President Choi is going to lead. Thank you, Creator Farmer. We've had uh, two meetings uh, of this Development Council. It is comprised of uh, four development or advancement leads from each of the campuses, myself, uh, Cameron Farwell, and Ryan Rapp. And during those meetings, we talked about the importance of focusing on collaboration opportunities, especially on those projects that are system priorities. So we spent time talking about TPMC and how we can develop joint visit opportunities for donors as well as foundations in which campus leaders from different universities can participate. We also talked about the need for having not only marketing materials, but also specific naming opportunities for facilities and institutes that will support TPMC, and as well as Precision Medicine Initiative. Um, just by way of an extension, during the campaign cabinet meeting at Mizzou, all four development or advancement leads were invited to that meeting. And it was decided that during that meeting that TPMC is a mouthful. It's hard to remember. It's also confusing at times. And so we're gonna be working with 160 over 90 to come up with a new uh, name for TPMC that is reflective of what we're gonna do, but also easier to recognize. We also discussed the Promise and Opportunity Scholarship Program, which requires a one-to-one -one match to support Pell Grant and near Pell Grant students at all four universities. It's a one-to-one -one match between campus and the system, and those contributions are then matched with philanthropic contributions. And just last week, UMKC, working with KC Scholars, announced a $20 million scholarship partnership to support 400 needy students in the Kansas City area with scholarships for over a five-year period. So it was a major investment by the university, but also a KC Scholars Program. Uh, so we talked about how best to leverage the resources at the universities to come up with the match to support this very important program that benefits our students. So that concludes my report. Thank you, President Choi. Moving on to our fourth informational item, I'd like to invite our Chief Marketing and Communications Officer, Cameron Farwell, to present on the, the dashboard that we've been putting together. All right, well, um, we put together our, the first dashboard that you saw at our last board meeting was really kind of a, 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 a 
our first attempt at, at trying the dashboard, but this one uh, includes information from the actual first fiscal quarter. And so the first one was kind of a practice to align all of our, our numbers, but this one actually gives us the full first quarter and then when we meet again for your next meeting, you'll have quarter two and you can see the movement there. Um, I won't go into the, into the numbers unless you have questions, but I think this dashboard is giving us uh, information that is um, helping us talk about how our different operations are different and uh, is raising good questions between us. Um, my colleagues who, who uh, presented earlier, uh, they did such a good job of, of talking about strategy and we have been begun to have those kinds of conversations. And so a lot of times when we put the dashboard together, we talk about why is this number high or this number low? And, I, and, and oftentimes it's just the beginning of what is making that number go up and let's understand that better. Um, so I noticed, for example, that SNT's um, social media performance is strong. And then when I visited SNT and I meet their social media person, I can see exactly why that's the case because it's, it's matching and she, she's quite adept at what she's doing. So it's definitely showing uh, strengths and in, in raising some questions for us as to why things are the way they are. Um, so this is, a, this is a beginning point, and so next time we can take a look at movement. Um, in addition to our dashboard, we also have the advancement dashboards, which our advancement colleagues gathered their um, data points as well. And new this time, you also have a list of advancement priorities for each of the universities. Um, those we weren't able to gather by the time the packet was put together, but you should be getting printed copies of those. Are there any key findings from either the marketing or the advancement dashboards that you would like to point out that you're sort of honed in on right now? Or One of the things that we noticed is, is uh, we are tracking uh, page views on our pages that are for incoming students. And some, some of the numbers didn't completely compute, so it, it caused us to look at that. I think also some of the headline spikes, um, the, you'll see spikes of certain institutions. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about some spikes that we saw with our Nobel Prize winner. So you definitely see things um, through this dashboard, but I, I think really, uh, already the group of us has, has become much closer and I think this dashboard brings up points for our conversations. Great. Okay, well you're, you're next on our list, your information item number five, if everybody is good with the dashboard. And I would encourage the board to review this, you know, we, we put this together and tried to put some metrics that all four universities could report on. They look at things differently. That was challenging to get there. But this was really meant to be a, a guide for the board to use to help uh, guide the strategic communications efforts across the university. So um, it, it's more meant for you all than, than you guys most of the time. We've gotten quite a bit out of it so far. Um, so Curator Farmer asked me to give a little view on marketing and communications efforts related to marketing uh, the Precision Medicine Initiative. So I wanted to give you an update on that. Um, within our partnership with 160 over 90, we have, been, we have asked them to help us develop a, a toolbox. And that toolbox really is aimed at helping us tell the story best. And one of the, the air, we've done a pretty good job of explaining the potential and, and why Missouri and what what talents we have to bring to bear, but we have struggled a little bit to talk about what this could mean to Missouri. And so 160 over 90 is helping us flip the script a little bit and talk more about patient impact, um, as well as developing how we talk to different groups about this project. Because really what we're finding, and I know a lot of the people who make these presentations, say it depends on the group as to what part of this project I talk about, because everyone comes from a different motivation. So right now, uh, 160 over 90 ha has done a series of interviews with different people to gather information about the project, and now they've moved on to creating what they call creative briefs, and they're, they're looking at it in three areas right now, and that is a, the motivation of should I give or invest, um, and that would be 
for donors or alumni. Another category is should I work at or with the Precision Medicine Initiative? And that is geared at corporations, faculty, staff, potential research recruits. So we talk to those groups in a different way. And then should, I should be proud of Missouri and excited about the potential impact to society. And so that motivation um, would be aimed at legislators or community leaders or the general public. So once they create those creative briefs, then, then we'll get a look at them and, and they will create a series of what we call one pagers, which are really the cell to each different audience so that we can have the best representation of this idea that people can understand easily. Um, and then they'll also provide us with uh, PowerPoint templates so that when we are presenting this idea, we have some continuity and, and also just a compelling look. And then finally, they will be helping us with uh, video storytelling on this. And so we will see that patient impact. Uh, they did a, quite a good job on the Anthem video for Mizzou, and I think we can expect that kind of quality here. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the videos will particularly focus on um, donors and why they would want to invest in this. So in the meantime, um, we are, continue to market this idea while we're developing these materials. And it's been an, one of the things we've done is capitalize on the fact that we have a Nobel Prize winner who just happens to have done his research in an area that is now addressing cancer. And so we have tried to capitalize on that and blend the story, the, the wonderful story we all can take pride in, in George Smith's Nobel Prize and how it relates to the TPMC um, effort. And so we've begun to blend those stories a little bit. So, um, and just, to, just as a slight aside, the impact of George Smith on the visibility of our whole system of Mizzou, of Missouri in general, we're really seeing those results. Um, George Smith, uh, we have had 2,000 stories written about George. Um, that represents 34% of the headlines that we've seen out of Mizzou, and Mizzou makes a lot of news. We have a lot of headlines, so 34% of our headlines since July come from George Smith. It's huge exposure for in, in a, showing off what kind of research can come from this place. Um, so using the, and the, other, the other thing we wanted to do with George is share him with the whole state. So we placed um, ads talking about his Nobel Prize in, in newspapers throughout the entire state. So we didn't want just the main papers, we wanted all the small town papers. And there was great response from that too. So then we began to blend the TPMC story with George. And so at the game last weekend, um, when the governor visited Mizzou, we had a video that talked about, congratulated George for his accomplishment and then talked about what that represents in terms of our research and how that will be translated, that kind of talent is available to make TPMC happen. So we're also marketing that blend to our other higher education partners. So we're working on a, a print piece that would go to leaders of other campuses that show kind of a picture, just a few words kind of uh, product that quickly shows the connection between Georgia's research and our ambitions for our future. Um, so, so this blend is, is really making some sense. Um, another example is that yesterday, the Chancellor and George were in Washington, D.C., meeting with student journalists at major national news outlets talking about George's accomplishment and also the TPMC. So that blend, it makes sense to make uh, use of that um, great news, and George has been so generous with his time and, and believes in the university in this effort. So. With that, uh, I think that's what I have. Cameron, thank you. That was a, a great report. I'm, I'm excited for all the marketing work that you're doing on the TPMC. That's great. That's great. <coughs> okay. With that, I'd like to adjourn the External Affairs Marketing and Advancement Committee. Uh, may I have a motion uh, from the committee? Uh, so moved. To adjourn Later. in a second. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, chairman, um, oh, all those opposed, say nay. <laughs>
No, none of those. Chairman, um, this concludes the business of the External Affairs Marketing Advancement Committee. May I make a motion? Thank you very much. Not that I am keeping score, but you finished a minute 30 seconds. <laughs> under, wow, so. great. If you're ready to burn like that'll give you something to aspire to. It does, and, and she was so much more eloquent with the, you know, solicitation of votes. I well, did we conclude it? Did we, is no, it no, over? no. Curator Sunvolt, we will need so that Ron Ashworth and Teresa can participate a motion and a second or, or a resolution uh, to go into executive session from your committee. Can I make my own motion as the chairman? Yes. I, I make the motion that we go into executive session. The Health Second. Affairs Committee. Second. Uh, all in favor? Nope. You've got to call the roll on it. Oh, session. Cindy, please call the roll. Curator Graham? Yes. Curator Phillips? Yes. Curator Snowden? Yes. Curator Sunvold? Yes. All right. All votes in favor. Are, are, are Ron or Teresa going to join us by? In closed session. In, okay. Uh, then we stand in recess, uh, take a short break, but then... Uh, uh, we're going to be joined, and I hope everybody of the general officers and chancellors know who's joining us. Uh, Alex, uh, Rick, Jonathan, Dusty. Okay? All right. <laughs>